Hello, testing. Hello, testing. Hello. Hello. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Dear audience, I Ms. Zain Fatima from the Department of English Linguistics and Literature, Rifa International University. Welcome you all to the first session of ICAL 2024, day two. This international conference serves as a dynamic platform for scholars, researchers, and practitioners from all over the world to converge and explore multifaceted dimensions of applied linguistics. It aims to foster a collaborative environment where participants can engage in meaningful discussions, share groundbreaking research findings, and exchange innovative ideas pertaining to the practical applications of linguistic theories. With a focus on real-world implications, it's a significant endeavor to bridge the gap between theoretical insight, practical language-related challenges, providing a space for professionals from diverse linguistic backgrounds to contribute to the creation of a dialogic, diverse, and inclusive world. Now, to begin with the name of Allah Almighty, the recitation of some soulful verses from Surah Rum will be rendered. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من آياته خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف ألسنتكم وألوانكم إن في ذلك لآيات للعالمين ومن آياته منام ومن آياته منامكم بالليل والنهار وابتغاءكم من فضله إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يسمعون ومن آياته يريكم البرق خوفا وطمعا وينزل من السماء Allahul 
جزاک اللہ خیرن کثیرن مے اللہ بلیس اس آل ود ہز کاؤنٹ لیس فیورز آن دس آسپیشیس اوکیژن لیڈیز اینڈ جینٹل مین پلیز رائز فار دا نیشنل اینتھم Dear audience, for this session, I am pleased to announce that we have two keynote speakers and four presenters along with two co-presenters. Our first keynote speaker is Dr. Sadia Siddiq. She's an assistant professor at Comsats University. She has considerable experience of 22 years of teaching journey at university level. Her expertise lies in stylistics, critical discourse analysis, semiotic multi-model analysis, appraisal analysis, academic writing skills, interpersonal domain of language functions, and paralinguistic feature pause training. Moreover, she has organized and participated in multiple national and international level conferences, trainings, and courses. Hence, it's with immense pleasure that I invite Professor Dr. Sadia Siddiq to present the topic active listening and argumentative skills. Over to Dr. Sadia. Thank you so very much, Zain. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So active listening and argumentative skills. Stay on the first slide, please. Right. So active listening is a very valued, effective, and much talked about skill. Its importance is visible through the fact that its unattentive mode, named as hearing, gives speech to the kids. Deaf children cannot speak. Hearing gives speech. While this unattentive mode of hearing leads to this enormous gift of speech, then the proposition seems quite logical that improved version of hearing in the shape of listening, active listening, can offer much more than just speech. Adding focus and attentiveness turns hearing to listening and adding peak of attentiveness turns listening to active listening. The term first coined by Gordon 1975, having roots in Jers 1951 conceptualization of emphatic listening entails not only listening through ears, but also listening through eyes, turning thereby 
to all ears. Next slide. Without judgment. Next slide, please. Without judgment. Without distraction. The previous one, please. Previous one, please. So listening through eyes, not only listening through ears, but also listening through eyes, turning thereby to all ears without judgment, without distraction, without competition, and with empathy, open-mindedness, and perspective taking. So owing to its great significance, the of active listening deserves to be explored, re-explored, and researched continually. The current study thereby ventured to re-explore the relationship of active listening with oral argumentation skills. And here are the findings. Next slide, please. So through this study, slide, please. This one. Thank you. Active listening is indicated to remove speech errors. The study identified two domains of active listening. This is a very interesting finding, by the way. One is listening to others when others are speaking. And the second one is listening to one's own self when, her, when he himself or herself is speaking. Now, this second one is very interestingly related to error reduction of arguments. This domain tends to make arguments errorless. Sometimes it is observed that one by mistake says the opposite of what one wants to say. For example, wants to say open the door, but unconsciously says close the door. Sometimes one stutters, fumbles, or mispronounces the words. This normally happens because of absent-mindedness. When, through this second domain of active listening, one stays mentally vigilant, awake, and attentive towards the words one self or herself is producing, the chances of these unconscious mistakes tend to be reduced from one's oral arguments. Next slide, please. Now, the finding of the uh, study also suggested that active listening tends to make the arguments multidimensional. An active listener listens to and absorbs different perspectives on the same topic. Resultantly, the arguments created are rich, multidimensional, concrete, factual, and complete. Next slide, please. Now, active listening tends to make the arguments structured. Since active absorbs, assimilates, reflects, and processes the information, Resultantly, the arguments created would be clear, structured, con connected, and sequenced. Next slide, please. So, through this study, active listening, as the forerunner of culture, cultured dialogue was highlighted. Active listening emphasizes listening without judgment, without competition, and uninterruptedly. This leads to stress-free, reverent, cultured, and dignified argument, style, and environment. Next slide, please. The findings highlighted that active listening leads to constructive arguments. Now, active listening entails listening with emphatic bent, 
without involving personal emotional flags and biases. So the arguments created would not be colored with emotions, but would be constructive, solution-oriented, and relevant. Next slide, please. The previous one, please. Thank you. It was highlighted that active listening improves information. The previous one, please. Previous one, please. Previous one. Becky, dear. Next one. Slide eight. Slide number eight. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Previous one, please. Previous one. Yes, thank you. It was highlighted that active listening improves information retention active listening revolves around focus and focus improves the memory which is a very strong support requirement during argument exchange the attentiveness as the part of active listening training has its role to improve the retention of information crucially needed during the arguments. Next slide, please. So it was shown through the study that active listening enhances non-verbals. Active and active list is again a very important uh, finding, a very significant one, a very, very different one. An active listener is trained to focus more on how it is being said rather than what is being said. So an active listener observes, notices, gathers this key resource of non-verbals, which resultantly becomes a strong accompaniment of the arguments created by an active listener. Next slide, please. So, Active listening nonetheless improves vocabulary and pronunciation. Words, technical terms, and appropriate ones, then the apt expressions and phrases all accompany the argumentative skills of an active listener. This benefit, though, is directly dependent, by the way, on the quality of the input received in active listening. So to get the perfect linguistic benefit of active listening, caution must be taken to select the quality input resource. Next slide, please. The study suggested that active listening tends to improve the confidence level of the speaker. Normally, people tend to lose confidence when they are short of words, information, perspective, clarity, structure, and connectivity. Since active listening fills all these gaps, and resultantly, it tends to improve the confidence of the active listener turned speaker turned argumentator. Next slide, please. Another significant finding of this study was that successful oral argumentative skill display will be achieved when all the interlocutors in a particular situation practically adhere to the principles of active listening. Next slide, please. Now the previous one, thank you. Previous one. All right, here we move on to the recommendations. Recommendation number one is training session of active listening skills should begin at a very early stage of a child even before the school where parents should train the kids for this skill. 
second recommendation is parents should also be given active listening skill training. Active listening skill training sessions for the parents should be available easily and recommended. Suggestion number three. Active listening training sessions should be given to the teachers at all the levels. Then recommendation number four, awareness regarding benefits of active listening should be spread through events like seminars, discussions, broadcasts, videos, conferences, and talks on all the different forums available. Now, one of the research participants, you know, shared a thought that really caught my attention and I want to share that with you. She said that parents have got a key role in teaching this active listening skill to the kids. She said that a kid should not be allowed to interrupt when another person is speaking. And similarly, no one should be allowed to interrupt when the kid is speaking. So interruptions should instantly be stopped verbally with sentences like, no, please, let him complete first. No, please, let her complete first. So kids should not be allowed to snatch away the words of others. And same training should be extended to all the things belonging to others. This way, acceptance, openness, respect, for the words and belongings of other humans will become the part of kids' personality. This way, a very positive individual, very constructive, dignified, with very constructive social and linguistic skills will be added to this world. A beautiful quote, I do not remember it exactly, but it says, hearing is what others and listening is hearing what others have not said. So active listening has got, and the arguments created through active listening have got this potential thereby to address the unsaid, the untold, and the unaddressed. So active listening up has got multi-faceted benefits in multiple directions. So hold on to it. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your valuable insights into the role of active listening and its impact on argumentation. As you have rightly pointed out as how impacts our argumentative skills. And in that regard, the role of parents and teachers can never be overstated. Well, dear audience, our next keynote speaker is Dr. Aisha Junaid. She's an assistant professor of linguistics at Foreman Christian College and University Lahore. Her PhD is in healthcare communication. She has a fellowship from the University of Liverpool, UK. Besides that, many prestigious certifications from US state universities. Having a number of publications in international journals to her credit, she has more than 18 years of experience of teaching. She's also worked at US consulate for five years and currently she's engaged in training healthcare professionals and teachers. Now I'd call upon Professor Dr. Aisha Junaid to come on board and present the topic, understanding the stakeholders perspectives on and medical communication in healthcare across cultural and linguistic analysis. Over to Dr. Aisha. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Um, first of all, I'd like to extend my thanks to the organizing team and uh, Dr. Muhammad Shaban for letting me present the uh, um, findings of my research here. Um, the topic of my uh, article is understanding the uh, stakeholders' perspectives on professionalism and medical communication in healthcare across uh, cultural and linguistic analysis. 
so the ev evolution of uh, medical professionalism is not at the same stage at uh, in all the institutions in in and countries uh, in the 90s the american board of uh, um, internal medicine tried to formulate their conceptual um, understanding of medical professionalism to merge core views into a generally standardized list this list of core competencies of professionalism in the medical field has been valued in several countries of the world. By this perspective, professionalism involves practitioners applying the principles of their profession and displaying vital professional behaviors and attitudes. For the betterment of healthcare systems and managed care, people are now thinking to bring about more positive changes in the attitudes and behavior of physicians towards their patients, profession, and staff, as well as the understanding of their roles to fulfill their professional responsibilities. In the present study, it was desired to compare the perceptions, learning, and practice of medical professionalism in Pakistan. Several authors writing on professionalism stress the role of cultural drivers in influencing uh, understanding and practice of professionalism. And this was of particular interest to the research. Can you please uh, uh, move the slide? So the objective of the study was to identify the perceptions of doctors, nurses, and uh, medical students in Punjab, Pakistan, regarding professionalism in the healthcare sector, and to find if being professional makes healthcare professionals a better communicator with their peers and patients. Next slide, please. So Hofstede's uh, theory of uh, cultural drivers was used in this research, uh, along with Bourdieu's social practice theory. Uh, uh, cultural drivers here mean uh, the customs, traditions, norms, backgrounds, and behavior of the members of a culture. Um, this is a, a qualitative research and eight focus group discussions with eight to 15 participants in each group. That is 65 individuals in all were used. Uh, they were held in various settings across the province of Pakistan. Separate uh, groups were formed of doctors, nurses, and medical students. Thematic analysis was undertaken of the transcribed data. The findings were compared with the evidence gathered from a scoping review of the literature. Um, a communication skills assessment tool with 30 items was used to check if the participants perceive the meaning of professional is also to be a good communicator. The set of questions that were held, uh, that were given to, uh, 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 to the participants had been formulated based on key uh, themes and debates within the international literature and were pil uh, piloted on a group of uh, five experts. Um, the comparative analysis of commonalities and differences in the perceptions and meaning making of these various stakeholder groups helped in developing an understanding of how cultural differences affect the construct of medical professionalism. The head of each uh, selected institution and, um, was requested in writing to facilitate the visit. Um, a hard copy of brief introduction to the researcher, the uh, study uh, topic, the rationale of the study, its objectives, and any expected benefits was also sent together with the copies of consent forms two weeks prior to the visit. The uh, head of the institution was requested to draw out a list of participants from each group st of stakeholders, ensuring maximum variability at uh, at least three days before the visit and have the list ready uh, together with the signed consent forms. Uh, participants were therefore purposefully uh, selected for the stakeholder groups to have maximum variability within the homogeneous groups of nurses, doctors, and medical students. Uh, each focus group discussion started after explaining the rationale of the study. All participants were informed that uh, participation was voluntary and that confide confidentiality would be maintained. All focus group discussions were audio recorded and then transcribed. When transcribing, a verbatim account of all you know, verbal and nonverbal utterances were developed and the participants were given pseudonyms to ensure anonymity. 
Um, after careful uh, transcription of the recordings and interpretative uh, analysis of the data was carried out, the themes emerged from um, grouping the quotes together with uh, uh, together and linking meanings to these groups. Initially, the quotes were uh, grouped into sub themes and similar sub themes. Uh, were then grouped together to form border themes, subordinate themes. No quote or sub themes was discarded. The themes were thus uh, identified and refined through yet another round of uh, reading, rereading, and listening to the recordings of uh, the focus group discussions while critically analyzing the quote, sub themes, and themes in order to ensure that the fullest meanings were uh, transferred to the final themes. Special attention was given to quotes that were a few uh, or marginal or themes that did not fit with other themes. Such quotes and sub themes were not discarded but carried forward individually because sense making and data analysis were not quantitative but rather qualitative in nature. Finally, mm, each uh, theme was clearly defined at the end of the phase. A full analysis and a write up was undertaken of uh, the themes and the meanings uh, they conveyed in the form of uh, sub-themes and what the quotes represent. Uh, can I go to the previous slide of uh, questions? So these are the research questions uh, that uh, mm, I had for my research. Uh, number one, what are the perceptions of doctors and medical students in Punjab, Pakistan regarding medical professionalism? How do uh, perceptions and understanding of medical professionalism differ amongst various stakeholders within the healthcare delivery system in Punjab, Pakistan? And how does the sense making of medical professionalism relate to sense making of their medical communication? Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. All right. So uh, the participants discussed um, uh, the understanding and per perceptions of the term medical professionalism and the factors that affect it within their own stakeholder groups. Four distinct themes were developed following a thematic analysis of focus group discussions. These were value-driven, adept, potential, uh, potent leader, and supported. Um, these four uh, subordinate or master themes were common to all stakeholder groups. Although similarities and differences were noted as to how these themes emerged out of the analysis of contributions to the focus group discussions by three stakeholder groups. The subordinate themes uh, represent key elements of the sense making of uh, the participants regarding the phenomenon of medical professionalism encapsulating both epistemological and ontological uh, dimensions. Uh, so medical professionalism is a very vague and intangible concept for the majority of the participants and Pakistanis related to cultural uh, best practices, societal norms, and uh, religious values. They confuse it with cultural taboos and uh, myths. Their adherence to cultural and faith beliefs varies widely across the province and it is somewhat what related to educational level. Um, in the current study, you know, various stakeholder groups, they identified themes that relate to the business model of medical professionalism. So the first theme uh, was value driven, which was further divided into spiritual um, as well as moral and humane. Uh, so I'll just briefly talk about that. Um, as far as spiritual is concerned, med medicine today is a secular profession for some, while for others, medicine still holds significant religious connotations. <laughs> the connection between the doctor and the divine was frequently referred to by various participants of the focus group discussions in all stakeholder groups and was based on the attributes such as God-fearing, belief in the divine, religious beliefs, and the re religious life balance. The sub-theme was later uh, further explored in terms of three components, religion as a source of moral professional values, belief in uh, divine healing, and belief in uh, divine retribution. The second sub-theme was moral. The um, components are maintaining a balance between ethics and 
culture norms more in, uh, according to the participants they mean it like so so being non materialistic charitable and um, altruistic following one's conscience and doing the right thing under all circumstances the discussion cons concerned ethical patient relationships like maintaining confidentiality respecting the autonomy of the patient taking consent seriously and being trustworthy as far as human is concerned the participants of the focus group discussions repeatedly stressed the importance of having a selfless character linked with notions such as altruism self sacrifice a caring uh, attitude being noble humble respectful and caring it propagated the value of systematically training uh, students and residents over uh, for the uh, development of traits that fostered Uh, professional behavior, including compassion, com empathy, kindness, generosity, uh, respect, and hum humility. Being human was identified as a trait belonging to a group of components, including showing empathy, sympathy, kindness, uh, showing humility and respect, and um, holding a belief in inclusivity. The medical students identified caring attitudes as desirable in a medical profession, and some. Time is something that they felt was appreciated by others. As the uh, the uh, second theme was adept. It develops out of a combination of sub themes and components referring to different aspects of uh, skills and their application. One of the fundamental uh, aspects that define professionalism is the profession of uh, possession of uh, specialized and up to date knowledge related to the profession, keeping abreast with. emerging knowledge uh, skills and even behaviors associated with them is also a requirement for staying within the community of practice uh, so it was divided into uh, the parts such as competent responsible um, these were the two sub themes uh, so participants related uh, adept um, as being competent that is learning knowledge and uh, skills patient safety and evidence based practice and the participants of focus group discussions they consistently referred to qualifications hey, and yes ma'am would you mind wrapping up your presentation as we are running short of time we are left okay. with only i'm just going to wrap it up okay so the third theme uh, was the important leader which was uh, divided into effective manager and uh, effective communicator uh so when we talk about effective communicator that means that the verbal attributes such as the uh, ability to be specific and focused in communication to use language that the patient can understand to counsel effectively to keep a seriousness in form non verbal attributes such as being appropriately dressed and uh, projecting a, um, a positive image of self exhibiting the right attitude for uh, effective communication conveying politeness a calmness patience and tolerance were linked to being uh, able to gain confidence of the patient um then the fourth one was supported fourth theme was supported um so the focus group discussions i'm just uh, wrapping it up um highlighted similar conceptualizations of medical professionalism as a phenomenon they maintained that Uh, certain skills knowledge attitudes and credentials were necessary for medical professionalism nevertheless there were differences in how they perceived uh, professionalism to play out within the societal and cultural context that was uh, depending on their role within the phenomenon and the unique relationship to the rest of the stakeholder in a way, as well as their place in society so while mbbs students they were concerned about a number of uh, essential skills like communication management and leadership not being taught uh, doctors were more concerned about how the system could be best supported um for they to they that could support them professionally and personally to promote professionalism in the wake of uh, increasing workload and uh, uh, the doctors were concerned much, uh, thank you very much indeed okay thank you so let me interrupt you well uh, it's been very much enlightening uh, to see how you have linked professionalism to medical communication and uh, it's been in that communication skills are an important ingredient to be a professional person in the medical field dear audience 
Our first presenter of the session is Dr. Safiuddin Alziabi from Isra University, Jordan. He holds PhD in Applied Linguistics from Swansea University. He is an instructional professor with a profound academic journey of 27 years. His research interests include second language acquisition, second language learning, lexicography, EFL phonetics, and phonology. In addition to authoring a few books, he has various publications in national and international journals to his credit. Now, I would invite Dr. Safiuddin Al Ziabi to present the topic Arab learners' stress performance with suffixed words, enhancing their lexical stress proficiency. Thank you, Zain. Uh, I'm uh, grateful to all uh, organizers for having me today. Uh, can I share my... Are you, you're going to manage the slides? Okay. I'll uh, be talking to you about uh, Arab learners' stress of uh, multi-syllabic uh, uh, items. Next slide, please. As you may all agree, uh, English proficiency is vital for academic, uh, professional, global uh, communication success. Uh, according to Abdi Karimova uh, and uh, Manasova 2022 and Lewis 2022, stress is crucial for pronunciation, uh, for conveying ideas, for imparting meaning, rhythm, intonation, etc. Next slide. It has been found that uh, EFL learners struggle with stress placement in uh, multisyllabic items. Arab learners are no exception. They do actually face uh, some challenges due to the diverse phonological systems in both languages, Arabic and English, and uh, due again to influence from Arabic. Next slide. It could be convenient on the outest of this uh, session to suggest a definition of the term stress. Stress is known as the strong vocal effort with which a specific syllable is pronounced. According to Roach, uh, 2009, a stress syllable is invariably stronger, louder, longer lasting, and higher in pitch than the neighboring or the adjacent unstressed syllables. According to Laddie Fogg, 2011 and McKay 1987, uh, prominence in one syllable is often accompanied by vowel reduction in the adjacent unstressed syllables. Next. Next slide, please. So it could be, uh, there, there could, uh, one could uh, raise a question at this juncture, whether Stress is really important for um, EFL learners. It could be said that stress to comprehensible pronunciation is like the uh, backbone to the uh, body. Uh, so effective communication, according to Kang et al. and uh, Kinwadi 1987, effective communication cannot be intelligible without correct stress. Again, Cutler, 2015, uh, states that stress plays a role in uh, derivational morphology, and again, it could play a role in recognition and differentiation. A word like contract can belong to two different uh, word classes according to whether the first or the second uh, syllable is stress. So we talk about contract noun and contract verb. Next, please. Again, stress enhances meaning interpretation. So in a in a in an item with the four phonemes b, a, l, and o, we could talk about uh, two different meanings according whether the first syllable is stress, as in uh, below or the second as in below. Uh, moreover, stress influences rhythm and uh, intonation. We can uh, deduce that understanding stress patterns enhances word 
combination. Uh, it enhances word combination interpretation and listening skills, and it results in natural sounding and fluid speech. Next. So again, it could be convenient here to um, talk about stress in Arabic and uh, English. Stress in English is said to be uh, unpredictable, although this might not appeal to some phonologists. So stress, according to Cutler, 2015 can vary across syllable positions within words and in principle it can vary contrastively. Gimson uh, 1980 states that stress is fixed and that the main accent always falls on a particular syllable of any given word. Next slide. Stress in Arabic is possibly different uh, from uh, English in that it is uh, predictable. Uh, Arabic stress uh, is uh, determined by the some uh, factors like number, weight, uh, position, and structure of uh, syllables. Next, please. Stress in Arabic usually falls on the heavy syllable or the super heavy syllable. And in case there is no heavy syllable in a, a, an utterance, it falls on the first or the last uh, syllable. Next, please. Uh, a review of the literature has revealed some inconclusive findings due to modest sample sizes, uh, lack of control of stress patterns, absence of a clear stress strategy for certain stimuli, suboptimal data analysis, insufficient intervention period affecting the training adequacy, and impact on finding generalizability in terms of reliability and validity. Uh, next, please. So we can uh, conclude that there has been no detailed investigation of how Arab EFL learners perceive and use stress. There is limited data on uh, their uh, reliance on uh, L1 stress uh, processing. So the present study will endeavor to fill this gap in the literature. Then uh, next please. Our study uh, attempts to answer some four different uh, research questions. These relate to whether Arab learners can identify the stress syllable in a word or uh, can place stress uh, on the right syllable, and whether they have any uh, specific strategies in their performance. Uh, and last, it uh, uh, attempts to answer the question whether training in uh, stress placement may improve their uh, performance. Next slide, please. Uh, the subjects used in my study were 210 third and fourth year Jordanian English majors with limited English exposure. Uh, their average age uh, was 24 years. Their GPA was about 83. And uh, the level of proficiency of the participants uh, was at upper intermediate to uh, advanced uh, level. Next, please. To do with the materials, uh, 20 productive derivational suffixes were uh, used with 80 base-free morphemes. Uh, 40 of these were disyllables and the other 40 were uh, trisyllables. So we got 120, uh, 160 uh, words. These were divided into four groups. Uh, with distinct sets of uh, suffixes, 80 roots and 80 suffix items. The, four, uh, the first group contained those words with stress carrying suffixes. The second group contained those with penultimate stress suffixes. And the, other, the third group contained those with anti-penultimate stress uh, suffixes. And the last group contained stress neutral uh, suffixes. So we got uh, in each group, 20 roots and 20 suffixed words, 10 disyllabic items and 10 trisyllabic items, and each suffix was used with two disyllabic items and two trisyllabic uh, items. Next, please. The uh, words used in uh, 
the stimuli were belong to the 3,000 uh, most commonly used words. The 80 roots categorized into 40 disyllabic and uh, 40 uh, trisyllabic words with distinct stress uh, patterns. As to the procedure, next please. Uh, the participants, uh, the previous one, please. The participants, no, next, next. Yes, the participants underwent production and uh, perception tests. The pronunciation, their pronunciation was recorded individually in a quiet in a quiet room using MP3 recorders. Uh, for the uh, perception uh, test, words were uh, syllabified, and the subject's task was to identify stressed uh, syllables. The stimuli were read by uh, British native speakers to ensure clarity, and uh, we again ensured zero acoustic uh, interference. Uh, next, please. Um, to do with the uh, stress training course, uh, 65 participants uh, volunteered and took a 12-hour Zoom training over three weeks. The program included uh, some uh, computer applications, software, uh, games, songs, sound uh, analysis, and interactive uh, activities. Next, please, as to data uh, uh, analysis. Uh, next, please. As to data analysis, uh, the perception test had uh, 32,000 responses, and these were uh, marked. The correct identification of the stress syllable earned one point. Uh, the mean scores were calculated for the correct responses. As to the production test, the utterances were analyzed with the Pratt. Uh, the instances of equal stress were excluded and any correct response scored one point, the incorrect score uh, scored uh, zero point. Uh, SPSS was used to analyze the data from both tests. Next slide, please. As to the uh, stress uh, placement course, the, uh, the results, the mean scores uh, for the pre and the post test training were compared to assess stress placement training effectiveness. Now, the results, next slide, please. As to the first uh, question, which, next slide, please, which concerned the, uh, next slide, please, which concerns stress identification, the subjects excelled in identifying stress syllables with over 80% accuracy. Uh, they showed particular uh, proficiency in disyllabic and trisyllabic uh, stems. The, uh, the, uh, the scores differed for stems and uh, suffix stimuli. Of course, they did better uh, in uh, the uh, stems. And this shows some challenges uh, in identifying the uh, stress syllable in longer words. Next slide, please. The second question concerns stress uh, production. The subjects face challenges in accurate word stress uh, placement. Uh, this finding supports the hypothesis that Arabs have difficulty stressing polysyllabic items. There was a significant difference in uh, performance between suffix and stem words. No particular suffix category caused any significant uh, difference. Next slide, please. The third question concerned the subject strategies, responses analyzed by item types and suffix categories showed no identifiable uh, stress strategy uh, followed by the uh, participants. Uncertainty arose regarding potential L1 stress uh, influence. And next slide, please. The last question concerned the effectiveness of the training course in stress placement. The figures here, the ones on the uh, left shows the uh, those for the experimental group, the pre-test uh, result and the post-test result. The, the ones on the right uh, show uh, the, uh, the uh, results of the control group. No improvement for the control group. So the experimental group here, 
according to the figures shown to you, uh, uh, score, uh, scored significantly and they exceeded uh, pretest, contrasting control groups, uh, minimal uh, change. The intervention then uh, might have contributed to the uh, experimental group's notable uh, achievement. Next slide, please. In uh, conclusion, uh, concerning the stress uh, perception and uh, production uh, tests, we can uh, conclude that Arab learners demonstrated uh, minimal difficulty in perceiving stress in suffix words. They encountered challenges in accurately placing stress on uh, most stimuli during production. They had no distinct stress strategy across stimuli or derivative uh, categories. Next slide, please. Uh, as to the impact of training on stress placement, stress training improved Arab EFL learners' performance, indicating further potential development. Uh, collaborative efforts are needed to enhance English skills in Arab EFL uh, contexts. Next, please. Next slide. So we can again conclude here that the results, the present results, align with the previous research and mirror challenges faced by EFL learners globally. This study remains a crucial step in revealing Arab EFL learners' stress perception complexity, emphasizing improvement through targeted training. Next slide, please. As to the pedagogical implications, the study provides valuable empirical data for teaching stress placement. So we um, deduce that uh, teachers have to uh, raise learner awareness of suprasegmental features. Uh, they have to foster L1, L2 relationships across English classes, emphasizing stress. Next slide, please. Again, teachers have to uh, integrate suffix word practice. They have to offer personalized uh, feedback and uh, they have to utilize advanced techniques and technology uh, for uh, effective word stress instruction as this enhances pronunciation, fosters enthusiasm and accommodates L2 phonological acquisition. Next slide, please. So we can recommend that future research has to explore contextualize stimuli impact on stress detection, and it has to investigate longer lists of controlled items and subjects. As to the limitations of this study, uh, the findings, the present findings may have rather limited generalizability to all EFL learners due to varying proficiency, uh, controlling settings and controlled settings, uh, word frequency and intervention duration. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed for your worthy contribution to understanding the specific challenges Arab EFL learners face in stress placement with suffix it would definitely help us all to recontextualize the idea of stress placement challenges with respect to Pakistani EFL learners as well. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, our next presenter is Dr. Alicia Razdorskia. She holds PhD in pedagogical sciences. Mm -hmm. Currently, she teaches English to Russian medical students and pedagogy to the mm -hmm. international mm -hmm. students. University at Kursk Russian Federation. Her research interests include modern methods of teaching foreign languages for medical students, developing creativity among the students and teaching English to bilingual students. She's also a distinguished member of the editorial board of the General of Journal of Social and Basic Sciences Research Review, Pakistan. Whereas her co-presenter is Mr. Nikolai Riskov, he is a fourth year student of the Faculty of Medicine of Kursk State Medical University. He is a member of the student scientific societies at various departments, including foreign languages, physiology, and pathophysiology in Kursk State Medical University. Currently, he is conducting his researches in philology and pedagogy under the supervision of Dr. Olesya Razdorskaya. 
Now I would invite Dr. Onisia Razdorskia, followed by Mr. Nikolai Riskov, to present the topic Creativity and its Role in Teaching and Learning English at a Medical School. Uh -huh. uh, good morning, dear participants of the conference. Uh, I'm sorry, do you have my presentation? I was sending it yesterday. Will you show it or should we show? Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, well, uh -huh. let's start. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Well, thank you. Dear friends, um, we are glad to welcome you. And we would like to present our report, our presentation about creativity. Uh, please, the next slide. Uh, so, uh, first, let me tell you about the background of our research. And I would like to explain first that in all Russian medical universities, including our Kursk State Medical University, English for medical purposes is a compulsory subject. Students study during the first and the second year, and I suppose that's not enough. But uh, all the universities, all medical universities in Russia are state universities, and the state decides how long will the students study. Uh, anyway, the teacher's main purpose is uh, to form their students' professional communicative skills. Uh, as we have listened today from one of the presentations, really a future healthcare provider needs good communicative skills. So, and uh, in our research, we would like to view this process of language education uh, from the point of view of both the teacher and the student. And moreover, uh, as being um, the researcher who is the author of re reflective and creative approach, I would like to say that creativity plays an important part in the process of teaching and learning English for medical purposes. So we would also see some aspects of forming creative skills. The next slide, please. Uh -huh. So the objective of our research is to show and to define the role of different types of creativity. We would show it as the example of educational, extracurricular, and scientific activity at our Department of Foreign Languages. Let me explain that uh, maybe we use different terms in Russia and the English speaking words. Here, the department, it's not like the faculty. Here, by the word department, we mean, well, the teachers who uh, teach foreign languages for the medical students. So um, our subject is compulsory as well as the other subjects are compulsory too. So we would like to show uh, the interrelation between performing creativity and professional applied creativity. It will be shown as the example of uh, one of the authors, that is the student's practical experience. The next slide, please. Uh -huh. Well, and uh, the theoretical basis of our research are um, different uh, works about uh, some aspects of creativity. And uh, these aspects were viewed by the psychologists and educators. Uh, moreover, I was using my own reflective and creative approach. Well, and um, one of my uh, articles were published, and you, you may see the um, name of this um, paper. So we would see uh, that uh, the process of teaching English for medical students is a creative person. And moreover, some creative skills are used by us in order to make this process more effective. The next slide, please. Well, uh, what are the conditions of forming creativity in the medical students? Uh, I suppose that um, the teacher of English should reveal the student's creative potential. It will be necessary because we need to develop verbal creativity and rhetorical skills. These very skills are important for the future uh, healthcare providers, for the future physicians, because the doctors can talk to different patients. They need to uh, use the proper words according to the different patients well, that they would see. So that's why they need the skills of verbal creativity. Uh, moreover, at our university, as well as in many other universities, we have a lot of conferences where the students take part. And uh, rhetorical skills are important for making presentations at the conference. 
According to the principles of reflective and creative approach, the stage of reflection should be carried out after the students taking part in the creative activities and the classes of English. I will explain a little bit later what creative activities are these. The next slide, please. Well, in our opinion, uh, in the medical students, the skills of professional or professional applied creativity should be formed. As I've said before, um, a future healthcare provider deals with me many kinds of patients. And moreover, uh, any doctor, any healthcare provider uh, has to perform different uh, pr problem solving uh, tasks. And that's why creativity becomes very important. Well, uh, and as you can see here, well, in the context of teaching and learning English for medical purposes, this type of creativity is closely connected with verbal creativity, which is a future healthcare worker's important skill. The next slide, please. Well, and uh, what is more important? Well, at our university, and as well as in other Russian medical universities, uh, all the students uh, get education in academic groups. Uh, they attend the lectures together. We don't have lectures in English, but they attend all the classes in certain groups. So that's why I would like to view group creativity. And it's known that group creativity is formed in the process of a teacher's and the medical student's activities at the practical classes. Well, and um, moreover, I would like to view performing creativity. Well, performing creativity uh, will be viewed here uh, as that one of, of the musicians, artists, actors, etc. But if medical students possess it, it should be taken into account by a teacher of English. I think that we should uh, view our students as uh, those who have some extent of uh, creativity in them. And if the students have performing creativity, uh, uh, it's very nice. Uh, my co-author will explain it as the example of his learning process and not only learning process, some extracurricular activities. So we find it relevant to use these types of creativity as the classes of English for medical purposes. And uh, moreover, I am a um, uh, I'm responsible for the activities of Student Scientific Society at our Department of Foreign Languages. And I think that this kind of creativity, performing creativity, is necessary for those students who will present at the conferences. The next slide, please. Well, I would like now to give a word to my co Hello, dear audience. Mm -hmm. uh, being a medical student, I think that the teacher of English for special purposes should organize a uh, joint innovative uh, activities with the students in the classroom. It can contribute uh, to the development of so-called group creativity uh, in the students. This is possible if the teacher uh, is uh, guided uh, by a new philosophy of education that considers creativity as a pedagogical category. Uh, in my opinion, learning in a dialect uh, form includes the interaction of students uh, from an academic group with each other. In Russian medical universities, there are academic groups of students. Each uh, student's personal experience multiplied by the experience of uh, his or her group mates allow the teacher to form their communicative competence and review their creat creative uh, potential. Okay. Uh, according uh, to the uh, Australian philosopher Stephen uh, Alexander Haslam, creativity develops in uh, terms in which creators improve their skills, uh, expand the boundaries of creativity, and cross them. The next slide, please. Our opinion, a group of students as the classes can also become a kind of uh, creative team. Is it possible uh, if uh, students have motivation to learn, uh, and the teacher has team building skills and acts as a coordinator of, uh, of the activities in the classroom. Uh, in our opinion, performing creativity can be considered uh, together with group creativity. Uh, in the her book, Creative Collaboration, Vera John Steiner gives example of rock bands 
as well uh, groups of writers, artists uh, or scientists um, that can receive constructive uh, feedback uh, from its members. Uh, during uh, the creative process, uh, musicians exchange new ideas, looking at new ways to tackle theoretical and practical problems. Uh -huh. uh, the next slide, please. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, and uh, I, uh, now I would like to uh, mention a few pedagogic technologies. So as my co-author just mentioned that uh, creativity uh, is formed during practical classes. So what do we usually use? So what, where do the students take part? Uh, first of all, I use imitation and business games. And of course, these very games, they show the communication of a healthcare provider and a patient. Uh, moreover, we use problem cases based on the real experience of healthcare workers. They were designed together with the other teachers, the teachers of bioethics, and they do pharmaceutical marketing and management. Uh, I have also some experience of teaching bioethics for our foreign students because they are taught in English. Uh, moreover, we use an interdepartmental education. Uh, I will uh, tell a little more about it later. Uh, so Russian students study English and international students study pedagogics. I teach them pedagogics and I will explain how creativity is formed while interdepartmental education. And moreover, uh, we use didactic dramas and their scripts are based on the interdisciplinary links and are written by both the teacher and the students. And I am very proud to say that uh, my article about um, didactic drama well, was published in a journal in Pakistan. The next slide, please. Well, um, our Russian students uh, study the topic stress. I mean the students of the Faculty of Clinical Psychology. So, and um, at the same time, I teach pedagogics for international students. So our students uh, that study um, English, or the students of uh, the Faculty of Clinical Psychology, they were making um, posters for uh, all the international students. And the international students use these posters during their classes in pedagogics. But some of our students, uh, of international students, turned to be also creative. They had so-called artistic creativity. And they made this very poster. And these were the students from Malaysia and Zimbabwe. And uh, at the class of pedagogics, they made this poster for the Russian students of the Faculty of Clinical Psychology. And uh, our Russian students were reading and translating their recommendations. So this is the department of, oh, sorry, this is the example of interdepartmental education and it is linked with creativity. The next slide, please. Uh -huh. So uh, I, I will just mention in all performing creativity and group creativity. And I was mentioning interdisciplinarity so in the photo, you can see the didactic drama about medicine in ancient Babylonia. It was staged by the students of the Faculty of Pharmacy, and it was uh, based on the links uh, with the other subjects that they study, that is history of pharmacy and medicine. So in this photo, you see that the healers are exercising an evil spirit that caused the king's and queen's illness. So the students use the knowledge of uh, the uh, history of medicine and pharmacy, and we were staging a didactic drama in English. The next slide, please. Uh -huh. uh, students' creative skills are also an aid for a teacher, the supervisor of student scientific society. Uh, as for me, the field of my research is linked with my creative hobby. I am making a research of etymology of uh, words from the slang of rock musicians. In Russian language, the slang lexical units are the borrowings uh, from the English language. My personal educational experience also confirms the effectiveness of formation of team creativity under the supervision of the teachers. The next slide, please. I was carrying out uh, master classes in nursing in English for the foreign students of Kirk State Medical University. 
Uh, I was uh, delivering preventive talks about uh, coronavirus infection at the secondary schools of the city of Kursk. Mm -hmm. uh, moreover, I often speak at meetings of uh, Student Scientific Society of Kursk State Medical University. Uh, for example, the Department of Pathophysiology. Uh, the experience of my creative performances as a musician as well as verbal creativity formed in foreign uh, language classes, make it possible to cope with the stress that can arise when uh, speak to an unknown audience. The next slide, please. Well, to sum it up, I would like to say that creativity is really becoming a pedagogy category. It is important for both the teacher and the students. So group creativity can also be a pedagogic category in foreign language didactic. So our experience of staging didactic dramas with the students prove it. Well, students really like the, that kind of activity and they use English and uh, they see how they can, well, they think how they can use English in their future professional activity. Well, and uh, as the experience of my co-author shows that even uh, performing creativity can uh, become a good stimulus for a student. It reduces stress and uh, the students are not afraid to take part in different extracurricular activities at uh, our university. Well, and um, that's why I need, I think that uh, even taking part in the conferences that even scientific uh, activity of the students uh, becomes one of the means of the students' creative expression. The next slide, please. Well, thanks for listening. And I would like to invite you all, I would like to invite colleagues from Pakistan and from other countries. Soon we will have an online conference at our university. Ah, uh, it was on the slide. My email was on the slide. You please, you can contact me and I am one of the organizers. Uh, we will be very glad to meet you online at our conference. Uh -huh. Well, thanks for listening. Well, please, you may rewrite my email. I will send you the invitation to our conference uh, about teaching uh, foreign languages as well. Thanks for your listening. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Alicia, for your invitation over to Russia. Inshallah, we look forward to you some other day, face by face. Well, mm -hmm. thank you very much to Mr. Nikolai as well. Uh, it's been enlightening for us to see how the transformative role of creativity has been in the development of students' professional communication skills while studying English at a medical school. Creativity does help the students to develop rhetorical skills, which contributes to position of various medical skills, such as the presentation skills. Very nice message. Well, uh, dear audience, our next presenter is Dr. Ovalabi Badmas Ajayi. He is an associate professor at the Department of English and Literary Studies in Federal University, Bukhari, Taraba State, Nigeria. His research interests are applied linguistics, discourse analysis, pragmatics, and social linguistics. He is a member of several professional organizations. Linguistics Association of Nigeria, African Pragmatics Association, English Scholar Association of Nigeria, and Reading Association of Nigeria. He has, to his credit, many articles published in reputable journals, both national and international. Now, I would request Professor Dr. Owalabi Badmas Ajayi to present the topic, Communication in Healthcare Discourse, a Linguistic Exploration of Exchanges Between Health Practitioners and among Jukuns of Nigeria. Over to Dr. Professor Dr. Ajayi. Uh, thank you very much for having me here and uh, good day to every participant over there. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to talk about uh, the background to this study. Language is an incredibly powerful instrument that influences the communication in all spheres of society, including the medical field. The culture as the people's uh, central will. What this means is that language is used within a social cultural setting. Effective communication in health 
involves not only trans the transmission of uh, medical information, but also the establishment of trust, empathy, and understanding between healthcare practitioner and a patient. One of the factors that shape the success or otherwise of healthcare discourse is the social cultural influence. This research investigates the linguistic and social cultural norms that affect the health discourse among the Jukun healthcare providers and patients in Wukari, Taraba State, Nigeria. The objective of uh, this uh, study, uh, uh, the focus is to identify the linguistic strategy deployed in the exchanges, highlighting the uh, uh, cultural norms that emanate in the exchanges, identifying the effect of the norms on the discourse and the participant. In healthcare system, a good patient healthcare provider communication is not just desired, but essential. Depending on the situation, healthcare communication also has a different uh, register. The subtle cultural differences weave into healthcare encounters further complicates the picture. Due to their education and experience, doctors frequently occupy position of power which can make patients uncomfortable or reluctant to voice their consent. To remedy this imbalance, it is necessary to adopt patient-centered communication by actively listening to concerns, validating feelings, and encouraging patients to engage in their own treatment. Uh, the Jukun people, the Jukun are the people living in Upper Benue River in Nigeria, commonly Will to be descendant of the people of Kwarava, one of the most powerful Sudanic kingdoms during the late European Middle Ages. The Jukuns are traditionally located in Toroba, Benue, Nasarawa, Bauchi, Gombe State in Nigeria and parts of northwestern Cameroon. They are descendants of the people of Kwarava. Most of the tribes in the north central of Nigeria trace their origins to the Jukun people and are related in one way or the other to the Jukuns. The Jukuns are divided into two major groups, the Jukun Wanu and Jukun Wapan. The Jukun Wanu are fishermen residing along the banks of the river Benue and Niger, where they run through Taraba State, Benue State, and Nasrawa State. The king called Aku was until he became a member of Northern Nigeria's House of Chiefs in 1947, a typical example of a semi-divine priest king. The theoretical framework adopted for this uh, uh, work is social linguistics and uh, ethnography. These fields are combined to give holistic views of cultural and linguistic strategies which healthcare providers and patients adopt in hospitals and clinics in Wukari. There is particular research sample three hospitals and clinics out of the six existing ones in Wukari town, which include Federal University Wukari Clinic, Federal Property, Wukari General Hospital, State Property, and Kwarafa Hospital Private Property. This percussive random sampling gave a room for proper representation of the hospital or clinics in the town and its vicinity. The data were collected in these facilities through participants' observation methods where the researchers were available during interactive sessions of health care providers and patients. Through this method, note-taking and audio recorder were used to record the data. Before doing this, the researchers had sought the permission of the hospital management and consent of the participant. All the data gathered are translated from either Jukun or Hausa languages to English. Native speakers were contacted for validation of the translation. Uh, analysis and discussion, Guararafa Hospital. The two data occur between a male record officer and a middle-aged mother of a boy patient, a female doctor and a male patient. The exchanges occur in question answer forms, including greetings. There were elements of non-verbal communication, that's say handing over the money for the cash. Elements of humor were also present. Code switching and mixing also present. 
linguistic and cultural barriers did not allow the success of the discourse. They also included taboos, forbidding expressions, sexual, genitals, social, etc. Instead of the mother to mention the name of the boy, he said, Angiami. Angiami means my king because it is forbidden for a woman to call her first male child by his name. General Hospital Wukari, this occurred between a Yoruba woman and a Juku male medical doctor as a male doctor and a male patient. Co-switching and mixing, like uh, such as Onawa uh, Sepiu, meaning, do you smoke? Ah, ah, a man was in a once in a while. That is, uh, yes, but it is once in a while. Were observed as well as a uh, nonverbal communication, such as kneeling. A wide range of uh, politeness instances were observed, including using sir, use of metaphor, pepper is life, by the Yoruba uh, uh, patient to reflect the, the Yoruba norms of eating spicy food was identified. Language barrier caused by educational status of the participants also reflected in the exchanges. Use of medical terminology such as X-ray also present. Federal University Wokari Clinic, exchanges were in form of a doctor staff and doctor student uh, situation. Elements of course switchings were present in the exchanges such as Agbo, Atom, Dampuama, Sakata. Must I say everything as it occurs? This includes, uh, also include the filler expressions such as hmm, eh, etc. Cultural barriers informed by taboos hinder the discourse as the patient find it difficult to alter expressions such as toilet, stool, defecation, etc. This also included sexually sensitive expressions. There were also instances of politeness, such as e, uh, please. Based on the analysis carried out in this research, it can be concluded that communication in health facility takes place through language among the healthcare providers and the patient. On the linguistic level, the exchanges were carried out with features of code switching and mixing questions and answer, nonverbal communication features, formality and informality, and metaphor. The exchanges were influenced by the ethnicity, gender, age, and educational status of the participants. On the cultural level, the exchanges were embedded in proverbs, references or allusion, politeness, humor, and taboos. These linguistic and cultural features show both positive and negative effect on the exchanges. In some cases, they aided the conversation, leading to a successful medical consultation. And in other cases, they lead to a breakdown in communication that prevented appropriate diagnosis and effective treatment. Something needs to be done about this scenario and very fast to, to ameliorate the challenge. This research has contributed to the body of existing knowledge by highlighting the possible danger of a breakdown of communication in healthcare discourse between the healthcare providers and patients and among the Jukun of Ukari in Nigeria. Recommendation. Therefore, the researcher wish to recommend that health practitioner should make use of interpreters. They should familiarize themselves with the cultural and linguistic norms of their immediate community for effective health discourse. Future researchers who work on possible fatal consequences that may arise as a result of a breakdown in communication in health discourse among Jukun of Ukari. Thank you for listening. So thank you very much indeed for your in-depth analysis of the cultural and linguistic aspects of health exchanges between healthcare practitioners and patients among the Jukuns of Bukhari in Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, our final presenter is Mr. Onestus Moses from University of Lagos, Nigeria. 
He is a doctoral student of English at the University of Lagos. He has published and presented papers in both national and international journals and conferences of repute. He has substantial expertise in pragmatics, multimodal discourse analysis, stylistics, and functional grammar. He is a member of numerous professional associations, such as Pragmatics Association of Nigeria, European Center Training and Development UK, and International Systemic Functional Linguistic Association, among others. He is also a fellow of Institute of, Institute of Advanced Studies and Global Arts in Medicine, whereas his co-presenter is Ms. Jayoba Olubumi Olutoin. She is a lecturer at Federal Polytechnic Ilaro Ogun State, Nigeria. In addition, she is a graduate student of English at the Akiti State University. She presented papers in both national and international journals and conferences of repute. Her areas of specialization are phonetics, phonology, and communication. She is a member of English Language Teachers Association of Nigeria as well. Now I would invite Mr. Onifidi, followed by Ms. Jayoba, to present the topic a socio-pragmatic study of selected women gender-related Yoruba proverbs translated in English. Over to Mr. Onipi. Good morning, everyone. My name is Onikwede Festor Moses. Can I share my slide from here? Yes, of course you can. Okay. Can you say this slides? Hello? Can you say this slide? I could see your introduction slide and uh, if you could present. Okay. Once again, good morning, everyone. My name is Oni Pedro Festo Moses. The title of our presentation is A Social Pragmatic Study of Silete women related Yoruba proverbs translated in English and is co-authored by uh, Jayoba Olubu Mulutoyin. This uh, 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 study centers on Yoruba proverbs. Yoruba is a philosophical saying that talks about the way of life the world of Yoruba people is a means of communication and it's communicate didactics, the moral lessons. In this study, we are examining the gender related aspect of the Yoruba proverb, how it portrays human, uh, women's uh, gender in a negative way. So promotion of Yoruba proverb through oral tradition and Contrary to social and linguistic standpoints, we have uh, scholars that work on Yoruba proverb like Olasubo, Olasubo 2021, Yusuf 1994, 1998, Ashimbola 2007. So this uh, previous work centers on gender related Yoruba proverb, but little attention has been paid to the metaphor used to depict women in Yoruba proverbs. So the objective of this study, the first objective is to describe the context through which women gender are negatively portrayed. The second one, to investigate the ideologies behind the negative portrayal of women in the Proverbs. And the third one is to examine the elocutionary acts 
they are mostly used in portraying the negative images of women. So the few literature review we review in these studies. So we have uh, Adi Bola 2021. He examined the metaphor, metaphorical aspect of Yoruba proverb through the lens of uh, critical discourse analysis. And Adi Amodo 2021 from pragmatic theories of inference and context. Likewise, Ashinyabola 2007 carry out systematic, structural, and conservative linguistic analysis of Yoruba proverbs. We have other scholars like Ola Bodu, Ishola. Hello, Ishola, um, and others. But None of the previous studies examine proper from a social. Social, uh, social pragmatic point of view. Uh, may I request you if I wonder if you can mute one of the devices that you connected because at the moment you connected through two devices. I've done that. Great. Excellent. Please go on. Okay, the methodology we adopted in this uh, study, we carried out interview and we consulted published works. These are the published works where Yoruba proverb has been translated into English. We have that of Kola Woli 1998, Ola Jedi 2012, Ola Shukwe Tol 2012, Ogu Moyela 2005, Adenowo and Balogo 2005, 15 rather. So the procedure for the data collection is descriptive, call it, um, qualitative. And the total number of the, of the proverbs cited in this work uh, were 25. So the theoretical framework we use in this work uh, is uh, Lawa's Pragmatic Theory 2012, and we apply the six levels of context, which are cosmological, sociological, social, psychological, situational, and linguistic level. So for our data here, we have the Yoruba fashion and the English fashion. I will read the first two because of time. So the first one we have, Meaning that any family that allows the women to be vocal will see the abnormal growth of the white arere tree inside the house. And the second proverb, which translates as the woman is a gossip, the woman is a traitor. So the data continue to uh, data uh, 25. Now, we have table one here. Table one, proverbs and the elocutionary arts. So in the first proverb, the elocutionary art there is uh, predictive. The next one is about claiming, stating, claiming predictive on and on. So it continues. So, In conclusion, the socio-pragmatic analysis of Yoruba proverb has revealed that this proverb do not just exist in word, rather they are formed using a day-to-day -day concept that are part of the life of a person in Yoruba land. Based on this, for a person to totally understand and relate to Yoruba proverbs, an understanding of the Yoruba worldview, which consists of the belief system, cultural and tradition is required. This work therefore further validates Lawa's social pragmatic theory as it has been proven to be accurate in the case of the Yoruba proverbs and, the, and their relationship with the Yoruba societal rules and worldview. This research has therefore succeeded in identifying the extent to which context and proverbs are intertwined 
it has emphasized the significant relationship between the mutual contextual beliefs and background knowledge that the proverbs interlocutor shares, and how that relationship determines the interpretation and comprehension of proven proverbs. Yoruba is a unique language whose speakers share certain worldviews, which are formed by common values, interests, and their predominant preoccupations, that is, warring, farming, and hunting. This study has shown how those, those interests, values, and most importantly, preoccupation affect their use of proverbs. It therefore insists that studying proverbs in isolation from the culture, beliefs, and situational context of the users of this proverb will produce sketchy or invalid results. So, suggestion for future research. The field of gender study is a fatal and interesting one that is worthy of more investigation because it shows how language works in society and helps in categorizing the social relationships between members of communities, particularly the areas of proverbs relating to negative portrayals of women in Yoruba culture which a very limited number of studies have tackled, needs to be explored more. Although the theory applied here is the classical one that is still in use in the field of social pragmatics and gender dis the discourse, further research could, of, could, of course, be done on the past present study topic using the new version of this theory. At present, however, as far as the research, as we research, no such new version exists. Also, we notice that the translation of these linguistic devices are different from one translation translator to another. It can be suggested that some research might be done to investigate the negative portrayal of women in other dialects of Yoruba, such as Egbado, Ijebu, Elaje, among others. Africa at large has several languages Comparative study can be carried out to see how women's gender is being portrayed. Moreover, terms of address and forms of reference contribute greatly to coherence of discourse. A study could consider how other African languages portray their women in relation to the context. So thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Onipidi Festus and Ms. Jayoba for providing us with a significant socio-pragmatic perspective on selected women gender-related Yoruba proverbs translated in English. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to begin with our question answer session. And in the course of presentations, we have received a number of questions. Our first question is directed towards Ms. Sadia Siddiq. And the question goes like this, uh, kindly explain the perspective taking aspect of active listening and how is it related to empathy? So thank you so very much for the question. So the word is perspective taking, right? So as you can see through the words themselves, when you try to look at the perspective, <coughs> other words, this is perspective taking. But the very important aspect of active listening is that this perspective taking for active listening is embedded in empathy, where you are trying to understand the perspective of the other person through his or her own glasses. You're leaving your likes and dislikes and your beliefs behind, and you are wearing the shoes of the other person for a while. This is how it becomes very much effective clear and you can come up with unbiased concrete you know analysis and understanding and maybe some help can be extended afterwards thank you well our next uh, thank you miss adia uh, sorry uh, Dr. Sadia, 
our next question is directed towards Dr. Alicia. And the question goes like this. Ma'am, what are some other ways of creativity mm -hmm. that can be employed at a medical school rather than uh, role playing or drama performance? Uh, well, uh, uh, why I was speaking mostly about role playing drama performers. Uh, the point is that unfortunately we don't have many hours for practical classes. Uh, of course, uh, we have some um, certain methods of teaching grammar. Of course, we have, uh, well, different tests. We have uh, cases, we have problem cases, but our problem is that English is taught for only two years and the classes, we have only one class which lasts for two hours and this class is once in a week. So that's why I suppose that really role plays, business games, detective dramas are the most uh, effective. But unfortunately, well, there's much to be desired. Well, our students come um, from secondary schools from with a level of English, which sometimes it's, it's not high enough. So I try to reveal their creative potential. I try to... <laughs> to engage them in detective drama in order to show themselves, in order to uh, form some skills of oral speech. But uh, I understand that we should think of some other uh, methods, some other uh, pedagogical technologies, but uh, still my experience, my uh, 27 years experience of teaching shows that uh, these methods were the most effective. Thanks for the question. Uh, thanks for the other questions. Unfortunately, well, there are so, <laughs> so many, well, or maybe fortunately, there are so many questions, but please contact me by email. I wrote you my email in the answers for the questions. Thanks a lot. You're welcome, Dr. Alicia. Thank you very much Thank for your question. Well, mm -hmm. we have so many other questions to be answered, but since we are running short of time, those questions can be answered in the question answer box. Um, wrapping up the session, I would say collectively, it's been a meaningful session in terms of the linguistic inquiry into a host of critical issues pertaining to medical communication, lexicography, English language teaching, and translation. I hope this session has enriched the audience with the collaborative spirit, innovative ideas, and newfound connections to continue advancing the frontiers of applied linguistics. Thank you all very much. Now there's going to be a brief intermission for the refreshment. The next session resumed 20 minutes later, right at five minutes past 11 a.m. according to Pakistan Standard Time. Uh, thank you so much. Sum up quickly. Uh, had these very valuable presentations with us and Dr. Aisha Junaid um, identified the perceptions of the doctors, nurses, and medical students in Punjab, Pakistan, regarding professionalism in the healthcare sector. And uh, they defined uh, professionalism as value-driven, adept, point leader. And uh, another point made professionalism only thrives when supported by the culture and environment. Then we had uh, Dr. Safi Elizabeth, uh, who studied the stress problems uh, faced by the Arab learners. And the recommendation was that practice, they must be given good practice and uh, pers uh, periodic person uh, personalized feedbacks, personified feedbacks to the students be given so that the stresses can be improved. Then we had Dr. Olisa, Radurishka and Mr. Nikolai Rishkov, and the research explored creativity's role in the development of students' professional communication skills while studying English at medical school. They recommended verbal and performing creativity. Um, they also recommended activities like imitation and business games, then problem cases, interdepartmental education and didactic dramas. Then we had Mr. Kilani Sikaru 
and uh, Dr. Aija Ajayi, and uh, they studied the cultural and linguistic aspects of the health exchanges between healthcare practitioners and patients amongst Jukan and Wukari uh, in Nigeria. So uh, the findings were that code mixing, code switching, politeness, politeness instances were used and the barriers were the education statuses and ethnicity and gender and age. And they recommended that uh, interpreters must be used and more familiarity with culture and language is recommended. Then we had Dr. Jeuba Ulubumi and uh, Dr. Onipid. And the study successfully established the link between the uh, different metaphors used and the contexts and the ideologies. And uh, a further research was recommended by them to establish this relationship. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear all. Now there's going to be a brief intermission for the refreshment. The next session will be resumed 20 minutes later, right at five minutes past 11 a.m. according to Pakistan Standard Time. Signing off, Ms. Zain Fatima, Allah Hafiz. हेलो नहीं यार नहीं आवाज आ रही सही तरीके से स्टार्ट है मैं स्टार्ट आप मुझे वन टू थ्री कहेंगे तो मैं स्टार्ट करूँ बिस्मिल्लाहिर्रहमानिर्रहीम अस्सलामुअलैकुम आई सबाजीज़ वेलकम यू ऑल टू द सेकंड सेशन ऑफ़ द कॉन्फ़्रेंस the session will be chaired by Dr. Humaira Irfan. She is an associate professor of English at the University of Education, Lahore. She her earned her PhD in social linguistics from the University of Glasgow, UK, on Higher Education Commission Foreign Scholarship. Apart from research contribution in the various prestigious journals, she was also awarded various visiting scholars uh, research uh, fellowship in University of Exeter, UK, and Arcada University of Applied Sciences in Finland in 2018. She is the founding president of Education Toastmaster. She's chartered with Toastmaster in International USA. I invite Dr. Humaira Irfan to present on the topic, Teaching Creative Writing in Higher Education, with reference to the poetry volume, A Soul Meditation. Over to you, Dr. Humaira Irfan, please. Assalamu alaikum. Dr. Humaira Irfan. Uh, can my screen be enlarged? speaker for Can you please enlarge my screen? I am not hearing my voice. I am going to put my speaker on my phone. Mustafa, I have to get out of here. No problem. Dr. Humaira Ifan, am I audible to you? Uh, yes, you are audible to me. Can you listen to me? Yes, we do hear you. Okay. Can you see the screen I'm sharing? Dr. Humaira Ifan, please go ahead. We can hear you, please. Okay, thank you. Can you see the screen? Uh, can you see my slides, my presentation? Uh, unfortunately, we can't. Hello, Ji. Assalamu alaikum. I'm here. Thank you so much, ma'am. Just wait for a few, few seconds, please. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Humaira Irfan, and uh, I'm very thankful to 
uh, International Conference on Applied Linguistic 2024, organized by RIFA International University Islamabad organizers for the conference invitation. The topic of my keynote talk is teaching creative writing with reference to a soul's meditation. A soul's meditation is a volume of poetry that is published by me quite recently. So I would begin with a very brief introduction to creative writing. I hope you can see my slides. Yes, so we know very well that writing is not an innate natural ability, but is a cognitive ability. It's a skill that is acquired through years of training and practice and schooling. And creative writers are essentially analysts because they dissect a number of experiences and emotions to forge connections between individuals and the broader world. Creative writing is a craft, profession. It is an expressive art, it's an intellectual activity. And the creative process of writing develops students' literacy and critical thinking skills. Learners' works of creative writing speak out with voices that emerge with an energy, vitality, authenticity, which reflect their creative engagement. This is a creative writing process model that I developed and it was published in my book, Testing Creative Writing in Pakistan. This process states that, first of all, the creative writers should be familiar with the, a specific genre of creative writing. Then they should have potential an ability to capture ideas. And they can demonstrate their creative writing potential using a genre that they have selected. So how English teachers should teach creative writing. English teachers should know that creativity in students' writing doesn't occur independently of the skills, talents, motivations, knowledge, and understanding of teacher. The creative teachers of writing are autonomous, competent, reflective and critical and work towards a vision of children who can think and act for themselves. It is clear that teachers need to be geared towards individuals, their passions, capabilities, and personalities. Creative writers commonly express their thoughts, feelings, imaginative ideas by writing poetry, prose, and drama in ways that demonstrated their creativity with language and ideas. Now, what is Pakistani creative writing? Pakistani creative writing presents a fascinating intersection of linguistic innovation and cultural expression. Rahman 
Tariq Rahman suggested Pakistani creative writing literature is not only a demonstration of the country's colonial past, but also a reflection of its post-colonial identity where English is used to express indigenous experiences. Pakistani writers often navigate a complex linguistic terrain, integrate English with local idioms, themes, and stylistic elements, thus enrich the language with unique regional flavors. Creative writing when transplanted into a rich cultural soil like Pakistan evolves, takes a new form and expresses and reflects its adopted home. As the title shows that I collected my data from my own published poetry that was A Soul's Meditation. It was published last year in December, 2023. So here are some research questions. First question is how is language with reference to meanings and relevance in the text used? How is distinctiveness developed through surprise and structure of the text? How are intuition, universality of themes described? How does the reader have an emo emotive experience through engagement, flow, clarity, deviation in the text? How is the writer's voice originality maintained? So this is how I just have taken few extracts from the book to show that how the correlation between language and meaning is developed. Just a few lines from the text, shooting up into great expectations like a cupid arrow, shattering the erected China statue into a million pieces, whispering woefully, trust me, it was an obscure vision. Stumbling into an icy apathy, her life strives at catching the straw, pleading gesture precisely flows into her veins, weaving intricately the twinkling meteor, a lifetime moment. It was page six. So how is distinctiveness through the structure of the text developed? Just a few lines from the text. I would just read out, recite. As a rocky cliff facing up titanic cosmos, gliding downwards as an illuminating halo, as a dazzling star amidst constellations, gazing austerely sideways at abrasive fishes, outer self transcend materialism, ensues everlasting solace and serenity. Absurd exuberance dissolves the heart, but trails off void within. I ruminate with wide open eyes. Am I in a trance? The creative writer has a voice and originality. He or she is authentic and energetic. With the creative piece of writing, he or she is producing. It's just an example. I'm, a, I'm an ordinary being, but you are an extraordinary personage. You are my leader. I am your disciple chasing you to the moon and far. You are my vision that won't perish, neither here nor hereafter. Am I lost in a trance? Am I lost in a gyre? 
So you can see that all creative writers have their own individual and unique style of writing. The teachers of creative writing should teach their students that they should write in such a way that the readers are engaged. Just a few lines again, an intimidating thought flashes across my mind is intimacy, ephemeral, tender feelings in a fleeting moment lend space to chilliness sending tremors in spine, making inner warmth, thaw, disperse, and fade away. These are a few themes that I have picked up and I analyzed in my research paper in my for my talk, but I have very limited time, so I cannot explain all these themes here. So these are just the main titles. You can have a look at these. For example, all these titles or themes are very unique and individual. Unification of two hemispheres, silent prayer, all is not lost, a divine personage, hallucinations, an impulsive slip up. The soul doesn't break up. Ocean, silence, lumber, walk away. A subtle question, a portrait on the wall. Here are some reviewers, international and national writers, reviews or blurbs about the book. Michael Cerali is an eminent American poet and he is the founder of US National Youth Poet Laureate Program. Professor Dr. Tariq Rahman is an author of the history of Pakistani literature in English. Professor Dr. Yasmin Hamid is an author of Pakistani Urdu verse and anthology. Mr. Athar Tahir is an author of Second Coming. All these are renowned and eminent creative writers. So now I would conclude my talk that I believe that the creative writing teachers or a teacher has to teach the students to develop their own individual voice, originality of text and structure, unique images, intuitive themes. And the poetry is philosophical and reflective in nature. For example, poetry is one genre of creative writing. And these are few lines about the book that was selected. The poetry is philosophical and reflective in nature, a soul critically, intuitively, and sensitively ruminates over key social concepts and practices of ideal and divine leadership, cosmic vision in silence, underneath closed shutters in a fleeting trance. The body searches its soul through subtle probing contemplation over the notions of prayers, hallucinations, dreams, and illusions. The hollow void is ultimately engulfed with the unification of two hemispheres. However, in the face of bristly voice, the soul doesn't break up and catharsis ends on an optimistic Memo. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your valuable presentation and congratulations on publishing the book as well. Uh, thank you so much.
Dear audience, our next keynote speaker is Dr. Musara Jabeen. She is an affiliate professor at University of Balochistan, Koita. She has an extensive experience of working as a research fellow at the Hastings Education System, Social Science School Canada, lead international affiliated with Imperial Way College London, Institute of Regional Studies Islamabad, and Defence and Strategic Studies Department, Karyazm University Islamabad. She worked at Lahore University of Management Sciences, LUMS, under National Linkage Program sponsored by Higher Education Commission of Pakistan. A topic of presentation is assessment of Think Act capacity and profane language in higher education students, a case study of National Defense University Islamabad. Over to you, ma'am. Dr. Musara Jabeen. Ma'am, I'm audible to you. Unmute yourself, please, ma'am. Unmute yourself, ma'am, please. Okay. Dear audience, our next speaker is Dr. Kelani Sakiru, OPAMI, Federal University of Cairo, Taraba State, Nigeria. His topic of presentation is Making Pigeon English, an Official Language in Nigeria, Prospect and Challenges. So we have Dr. Achha, Sir. Yeah. Yeah, am I visible? Yes, ma'am, you are. Uh, can you listen to me? I'm audible as well? Yes, ma'am, you are. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi Shrali Sadri wa Yassir li Amri wa Nabi Ugdatu min Lisani wa Qawli. Allah Ta'ala hume har wal mata farma jo tere nizam ke liye nafa bakhsh hai aur har usil se bacha jo tere nizam ke liye nafa bakhsh nahi hai. So firstly, uh, I would like to admit myself to uh, while presenting my research, uh, which I have just started, or it is not almost concluded, uh, I would be also speaking a bit of Urdu as well. Because uh, English is not my mother tongue. So maybe if I feel something to be expressed uh, equally, so I may be using certain Urdu language as well. So I guess uh, the audience is comfortable. This is my limitation, first thing. Uh, second thing is that uh, uh, I guess I would not be able to exactly showcase the literature review regarding my study, uh, but I can uh, I can show off my book that is the topic of my postdoc program at Cardiff Business School in UK, and my book is uh, Thoughtful Intelligence: A Practical Guide for Moral Development. So the Thoughtful Intelligence says that if a person uh, is able to realize to realize that what he or she thinks, speaks, or does, how it impacts the other person, the other organization, or even the other nation. So this is the thought. And uh, so uh, keeping all this in view and my experience of 32 years at universities, so I'm uh, with this topic. And I have uh, personally seen that how the uh, profane language is uh, is uh, is going to be to to dominate our cultural values and everything. So the profanity, uh, which I would like to explain as as it is a it is a thinking or it is a wording or it is acting or the body language with the usage of words, 
uh, that that derogates the other person. So that makes me to take a stand with the uh, with the uh, poetry review of Alama Iqbal, where he says, "Admiyat, uh, admiyat means that insan. I mean, the the mankind must be respected." And what is the man? I mean, how we would be able to, to, to assert that what is the respect of the man? The respect of the man is that once we are able to showcase the worth of a man, insan, I mean, every individual's what is the worth of that? And the first thing which we have to utilize is the words. I mean, through words, we we tell tell to the other person that this is your importance right so uh, the the worth of mankind as in uh, ayah number 70 of uh, surah bani israel in quran e pak it is written that god has created every man with worth with honor so it is that honor that which may not be implicated by our certain words right so here we go with the that profanity showcases shows cases of impiety and disrespect. So the other word for or the antonym of profanity is politeness. So the two things regarding profanity I will be emphasizing what I have utilized in my study is that impiety and disrespect. And politeness means that you know insinuates piety and respect. So we have to see that what is the difference between profanity and politeness that we don't, don't realize in our daily usage of words. So the two dispositions of civility and civic sense. Now, increasing level of uh, a profane language in the students of higher education indicates the development of rudeness. Now, let me uh, share with you that to explain, I mean, at, at least four words regarding this slide that rudeness, what is rudeness? Now, rudeness means that uh, we don't respect uh, the values of the others. For example, I very much emphasize punctuality. And if I invite somebody and he or she doesn't reach in time in my office or in my class or uh, in, at my place, so of course I feel uh, disrespected. So that, that is rudeness. And uh, the other example in rudeness in our life we can emphasize is that, that I don't say thank you if somebody gives me a glass of water. And I don't say sorry that if I have uh, split something uh, against your favor, uh, against your interest in some meeting or in somewhere in some social gathering. So I don't say sorry to you. So if I don't say thanks or if I don't say sorry, so it means that I am rude. Uh, the point is that, that the profane, lang uh, profane language is that, that how we use the words uh, carelessly, uh, impacting negatively the others, and then we don't use those words which uh, which extend or accelerate the uh, status of the other person as being polite. Right. Uh, the third thing is that that we condescend the ideas of the others. Like, I mean, if somebody gives some idea, we just ridicule it. That uh, as as we don't like it, so the idea must not be ridiculed. Uh, let's say but recently I have uh, started to make certain recipes uh, with the with talbina uh, as a base of uh, cake. So it might be a few people they don't like it, and and uh, because of Islamophobia, they 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 call me that please give it some other name. Don't use talbina cake. Uh, so it means means it is a disrespecting of my my cuisine value. So it is a rudeness from the other side. They must accept it because if I'm using uh, maize, which is which was very much liked by our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and they, I mean, without caring the health value of uh, maize or jaw in our life, and they disrespect that. So for me, it is a rudeness. So it is a thing that how I feel. Um, the other thing, the other thing in this slide is that the irreverent behavior. Now, the irreverent behavior is also portrayed by our thinking, by our words. The examples can be the mocking of religious personalities. And of course, again, I give, I'm a student of international relations as well. So I give you the example that most of the time the mocking um, 
features created regarding our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Of course, we dislike it. So this is a disrespect. So this is an irreverent behavior. So whoever is doing it, even, even the French people or the American or whoever, is of course, they are they are they must be called as having irreverent behavior because they don't respect our Prophet. The other example is that usually I, I'm also teaching uh, Pakistan studies at Rifa International. And believe you me, it's a lighter way. I'm just sharing with you that uh, when I start my first class, so I, I play on the national anthem of Pakistan. So what are the gestures of the people you see? I mean, they um, they 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 start to uh, to laugh that oh this is this is just a thing this a madam is nonsense that no teacher plays the national anthem and why why we should be uh, offering a national anthem before any every class and then what they do they start to look down they they start to do I mean certain uh, physical features so I mean. Uh, 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 that that shows that that shows their irreverence irreverence for the national symbol that is our national anthem. And uh, the other thing, the other example, we can say that if somebody is uh, not feeling well around me, and uh, I, I use certain words uh, which uh, which which mean that I don't realize that the other person is sick, or um, if I'm not able to perform certain words, if if a person is died, so that is that is an irreverent behavior. So I must be respecting the situation. In fact, for example, if few of the Christians they are around me and they are celebrating the uh, their Easter or their Christmas, so why I should not be saying to them that Happy Christmas? I mean to them, if if they are happy. So uh, basically, the profile language, the study, the the inspiring point for me was that to realize that 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 what is humanity. As as Alama Iqbal said, Armiyat is 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 basically is is the respect of the of the mankind of of the man. So ba khabar ashu ehtaram adami. I mean, we should be able to understand that how we would be able to uh, pay respect to the. Uh, Go please wrap up your presentation as soon okay. As well. Okay, so I have five slides. I will. I should be quick. So this slide was the longest one for me. <laughs> uh, right. So uh, the point is that that uh, keeping in view that what is profane language and what is the irreverent behavior, it uh, whoever is doing this, it reflects the quality of the person who is who is using the profane words, and at the same time, it is it is affecting and it is impacting the other person. Right. So the hypothesis of the study was the profane word or act cannot impact positively. It's I mean, they say that what, ma'am, what it happens that if I say, I mean, even I saw some messages from the stewards to each other. They, I, she said that uh, my pet, my bitch is uh, is the love is my love. So she wrote to her friend, dear bitch. So of course, to call a a, a very, I mean, a, a person a, or a human being as a bitch is quite derogatory. So it should not be allowed that whatever the context is, its ripple, ripple effects may cost the individuals, the organizations, even the nations when they are ranked in national character. So this was uh, the hypothesis. The objective was, the objective of this study is to identify the increase in profanity and the causes of increase of profanity to insinuate the task force to eradicate profanity in the society. So everybody knows that of course, because of globalization, because of social media, uh, and uh, I, I, I guess uh, I, uh, this is also one of my findings of the study that it is not only that the other uh, cultures or they are uh, imposing uh, profane language or, on us. It is it is we are also losing our own language. So that is also uh, one of the main cause. And the third last slide is that that I should be able to showcase you my variables. So the independent variable is frequency and intensity of using profane words. And the dependent variable is rudeness. So the mediating variable which can change the situation is the politeness, that how to inculcate politeness among the people. So the methodology was the, or is the study utilizes observation, focus group discussion and structured questionnaires in its research design. The sample population is 120. We are just trying to, to hold up that what is profanity understood by the students. And then later on, uh, the other things would be carried on. 
uh, as it is a qualitative studies. So they are randomly chosen in terms of gender and in terms of grad and undergrad programs, but selected on the basis of having at least two years uh, experience in higher education. So the last slide, the study is a contribution to raise the self-esteem of the individuals as tribute to human development for the sustainable society. It is a support activity for assessing and responding profanity in deliberative way. So this is all from my side. So I guess I completed in time. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. So you so the much. questions are there, so I would be happy to answer. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, dear audience, our next speaker is Mr. Kelani Sikaru, uh, OPME, Federal University of Akairu, Taraba State, Nigeria. Topic of presentation is Making Pigeon English, an official language in Nigeria, Prospect and Challenges. Over to you, Mr. Kelani Sikaru. Mr. Kelani Sekari, are you here, sir? Mm -hmm. Mr. Kelani, am I audible? Mm Good day. Good day all. My name is Kelani Shakira Poyemi. Miss, am I audible enough? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, please permit me to share my screen from here. Sir, you can do it, please. Okay, thank you. Could you please share your slides? I'm trying to do that, please. Okay. So there is a, a oh, center. Please, it seems it seems I'm unable to do that, but uh, still I can carry on with my presentation. And Sir, if you okay. can help. go ahead, please. All right, thank you. Um, the topic of my presentation is uh, making Nigerian Pidgin English an official, uh, an official language in Nigeria, the prospects and the challenges. Um, in Nigeria, there are various languages, about 500 of them, um, and they are classified into major and minor languages. Uh -huh, thank you for that. Um, Pidgin English is uh, one of the languages that is widely spoken in Nigeria. About uh, one, 130 million Nigerians are speaking the language and um, it contains features of other languages apart from being uh, an English language or it's dominated by English features and uh, other indigenous language features are also present in the Pidgin English. There have been arguments on why should English be an official language in Nigeria, why there are other indigenous languages, and then um, these arguments are born out of the fact that English being a language of the colonizers has uh, received a lot of uh, criticism and uh, Nigerians feel one of our indigenous languages should be uh, an official language. However, there are fears that if one of the major languages is made an official language, there will be a kind of uh, language that to others or some, some language will go into extinction and uh, fear of political domination and so on. So therefore, I research on uh, the prospects and challenges of making Pigeon English uh, Nigeria Pidgin English, an official language. So let me quickly go to into the Nigerian social political landscape. Thank you. 
most Nigerians speak more than one language, especially the educated ones, because apart from their indigenous language, English is also taught in, the, in schools. There are three major dominate, uh, dominating uh, languages in Nigeria, which include Hausa, which is widely spoken, Yoruba and Igbo language. Then Nigeria Pidgin English gives Nigerians for, uh, from all walks of life a common linguistic space and transcends regional boundaries with its blend of indigenous languages, English and Creole features. So Nigerian social uh, linguistic environment is a dynamic and complex phenomena made of historical forces, languages, and identities. Next slide, please. So let me quickly look into the features of Nigerian Pidgin English. The language is influenced by indigenous languages. There are features and uh, borrowed lexicons from other languages into the language. It is frequently used in code mixing and code, uh, code switching in particular, with especially the, the indigenous languages. Um, the MPE is easier to acquire and more systematic than the standard English. They have abandoned morphological and syntactical anomalies, but they haven't given up on being able to clearly and concisely convey the language requirement of their speaker. It is widely spoken and people understand it, even though it doesn't have a, a very rigid uh, uh, grammar. MP is marginalized and in, uh, in official areas, but flourishes in informal space, where it's essential to popular culture, music, and business. It is used in art, business, and uh, in commerce, and so on, and uh, in social, social uh, settings. MP adds a distinct flavor to vocabulary by freely incorporating words from English, Portuguese, Yoruba, Igbo, Hausa, and other languages, and so on. Uh, please, next slide, please. Not this one. Let's go to the morphology. I mean, um, methodology, sorry. Thank you. Um, this research is focused on uh, survey of uh, users of the language. So I get the data for this research from universities because the language that's uh, the MP in Nigerian Pidgin English has received criticism from the educated Nigerians because they feel why the language should be made an official language. The uneducated ones do not have any problem with it, even if it is an official language. But the problem it faces comes from the educated Nigerians. And uh, I decided to get my data from 12 Nigerian universities. I, I, I tried to sample 50 responses from each, 12, uh, each of the 12 universities. And um, the data I was able to get from them are seen in the next slide. Please, next slide. Responses received. So from University of Ibadan, which is situated in Oyo State, I, I was able to get 46 responses from uh, Federal University of Yekiti in Yekiti State. The two universities are from the southwestern part of the country, University of Portacourt and University of Bene from the south-south, University of Nigeria, Isoka and Alex Akwema Federal Universities from uh, southeast, University of Iloria and University of Jos from the north central of the country, Federal University of Ukari and University of Madiguri from uh, the northeast, Amadibilu, uh, University Saria and Federal University Brain KB from the Northwest. We have six geopolitical zones in Nigeria and all the geopolitical zones are represented by two universities. So from the 600 proposed uh, responses, I was able to get 510 from the universities. Please, let's move to the next slide, please, where the analysis is. During the course of the research, I was able to, I was able to, uh, the researcher was able to, to identify that uh, 280 people, which have the percentage of 54.9, uh, are youths who range from the age of uh, 15 to 35. Why 190 people? 
have between the ages of uh, 36 to 50, why 270 res uh, respondents are students, why 140 are academic staff of universities, and uh, 100 of them are non-academic staff of, uh, of universities. In looking at the awareness and usage of the Nigerian Pidgin English, how do people use it? And even uh, are people aware of the existence of it? So from the 510 people, 483 people are familiar with it. Only 27 people mentioned they don't use it. This represents about 94.7 and 5.30% uh, 5 respectively. On the frequency of their usage, 18 respondents have never used it. So that's the lowest category. Why 92 really use it? In addition, 151 people sometimes use it. 211 people uh, frequently use it. That's the largest use. And only 38 respondents always use the Nigerian Pidgin English. These people are from uh, the, uh, they are from Edo State and places like that worry because the language is dominant in those places. Next slide, please. Excuse me, sir. So you have one more minute, please wrap up your presentation. Okay, in prospect of, uh, of making the Nigerian Pidgin English uh, an official language, it is observed that many respondents are of the opinion that the language should be made an official language because of the prospect, like uh, it can make communication easy in the country and uh, it fosters economy. And um, even in terms of education, it makes comprehension, learning and uh, teaching easy in the classroom. And the challenges, some participants feel that uh, making it an official language, we make a kind of downlook on Nigeria for using uh, a non-standard language as an official language. And um, the recommendations, I recommend that, uh, the researcher recommends that Nigeria should have more positive attitudes towards the language since the country cannot make one of her indigenous languages an official language, but rather national languages. Um, in conclusion, there are the prospects of uh, making Nigeria Pidgin English official language will contribute to the uh, uh, communication of the country. It will make communication easier and um, it will foster economy of the country as people use it more in trade. Um, thank you for listening. I am Kilani once again. Thank you so much, sir. This study will be really helpful to comprehend the language complexities in Nigeria. Next, we have, dear audience, the next keynote speaker is Dr. George from Kimpung Sanang Charity and Education Foundation, Singapore. Dr. George Jacob is a well-known educator and vegan activist in Singapore. His co-presenter are Dr. Ingrid Galvin Totten from State University of Yogyakarta, Indonesia, Dr. Sheng Hao Zhu and Dr. Ming Hu Chao from University of Malaya, Malaysia. The topic of presentation is three case studies of collaboration on research in ecolinguistics. Over to you, Hello. sir. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello, please. Yeah, I hope you can hear me now and yes, see our slides. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. So we're going to talk about three studies we did recently on ecolinguistics. So before we start, we hope that you all will stay in touch with us. So here are our email addresses for myself, for Ingrid, and for Chung Hao. So you don't need to put questions in the chat. You can email us, and then we can have a discussion after the conference as well. 
So we'll start with a little background on ecolinguistics, then we'll have the first study presented by Chung Hao, the second study by Ingrid, and the third study presented by me. Then we'll talk a little bit about the benefits of collaborative research in ecolinguistics. And we certainly hope that you will get in touch with us to collaborate. Finally, we'll have a conclusion. So a little bit of background on ecolinguistics. If you go to the excellent website of the International Ecolinguistics Association, the URL is there, you'll see this definition, that ecolinguistics is exploration of the role of language in the life-sustaining interactions of humans, other species, and the physical environment. Also on the website, there's a free online course based on the book by Aaron Stibbe called Stories We Live By. Now, a frequent question is, what's the difference between critical discourse analysis and ecolinguistics? Well, very similar. The key is that ecolinguistics focuses on non-human earthlings and on nature. And of course, we need to point out that critical isn't just about negative comments, it means critiquing. For example, there's also something called positive discourse analysis. And that highlights discourses that promote empowerment and social change. So a key milestone in ecolinguistics was way back in 1990 when Professor Halliday gave a talk called New Ways of Meaning, a Challenge for Applied Linguistics at the ILA Conference. And by the way, this year, the ILA Conference will be in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Halliday said, language does not passively reflect reality. Language actively creates reality. Our reality is not something ready-made and waiting to be meant. It has to be actively construed. And language evolved in the process of and as the agency of its construer. And <clears throat> two key terms are anthropocentrism, the idea that humans are the center of everything, that humans are superior, worth more. And its opposite, ecocentrism. All species have intrinsic worth. Economic growth should not be as important as protecting species. Some areas of Earth should be protected from human use. And non-human animals' perspectives should be shown. So let's go over to Cheng Hao to talk about the first study that we did together. Thank you, Professor Jacobs. Um, now, please allow me to introduce our first study, which is about the representation of civet coffee into Indonesian newspapers. So civets are small wild mammals who live in tropical regions of uh, Africa and Asia. And civet coffee, also known in Indonesian as coffee luwak, is a very high priced coffee made in Indonesia and in many other countries too. It is made from coffee beans after the beans have passed through the, the digestive systems of civets. <laughs> so the motivation of our focus on civet coffee is actually that uh, we notice that the attention now given to civet coffee and the coffee's profit-making potential have resulted in harm to the civets. So we, we uh, constructed a corpus based on articles from two leading newspapers in Indonesia, the Compass and the Jakarta Post. Uh, we accessed the, the websites of the two newspapers and collected articles mentioned Kopi Luwak, Luwak Coffee, and Civit Coffee from April 2008 till September uh, 2023, last year. Then we conducted a series of eco-linguistic analysis based on the work of Sibis, nine types of stories in texts, so that we can have such observations as wild civets, various captive civets, 
page service in tourism, production process, civic coffee, taste, quality, and price, civics as machines and workers, and farming of non-human animals. Here I will take the our analysis of civics as machines and workers as an example of our eco-linguistic analysis. So in this analysis, we used metaphor, which is one type of stories pro proposed by Stevie. And in the context of metaphor, the source frame serves as the foundation for illustrating a more abstract concept by drawing from a distinct and often more familiar to us sector of life. And for example, a very familiar metaphor is like Mother Earth. So here, from the corpus we constructed, we also find uh, some metaphors. And here is one linguistic instance for good coffee quality. For good coffee quality, sorry, next slide, please. Yes. So for good coffee quality, the health of the civics as grinding machine must be considered. And the, the nutritional content, content of food given must be considered. So here, civics are described uh, uh, metaphorically as walkers or even machines. And civics are turned into commercial objects and their entire process uh, and the uh, entire process machinists the, their body along a production line, starting from their mouth and ending at their annals. Such a such an anthropocentric, uh, anthropocentric or human-centered perspective is of course very evident. And Stevi also observed this kind of metaphor. What 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 he called. <laughs> Nature is a machine metaphor and commonly viewed as harmful to nature because it justifies the exploitation of nature and describing this exploitation as normal, just as no one would question the use of machines. So such metaphors justify the mistreatment and under variation of nature, including civics we found in the study. There are many other observations we have in the study, but due to the time limitation, yeah. I will not introduce them one by one. Yeah. Here yeah. We think yeah. that language plays any problem. Language plays key roles in the construction of society, including the economic system of society. And ecolinguistics empower people to better understand the role language as okay. ecolinguistics well, offers ideas and as to how language can facilitate resistance to injustice that breed and justify injustice. So now I'm going to pass the flow of this presentation to, to Ingrid. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone in the audience. This is the second study that consists in, in analysis of ecolinguistics and environment. Sorry. Can you hear me now, right? <laughs> okay. So this is an ecolinguistic and environmental education analysis in textbooks to teach English and in the This analysis was based on Stevie's and the stories will apply uh, the UN environmental education objectives. It was a content analysis that consider uh, images and text modalities. We were trying to look for positives and try to making suggestions out of it. Next one. These are the six UN environmental education objectives. As you can see, it consists in awareness, understanding of knowledge, um, concern, skills, and ability to evaluate proposed solutions to environmental problems. But we would like to ha highlight number six, that is participation, as if we do not actually do something to protect the environment, the other five objectives are kind of worthless. Next one, please. Here are some of the findings related to 
the themes or topics that we identified in the content analysis, and then um, the link to the echo uh, linguistic form of story based on Stevie. Um, as you can see, most of the themes or topics were related to anthropocentric ideologies that leads to destructive discourses against the environment. We did find some uh, beneficial discourses or echo ideologies, but it was not the majority. Next one, please. In regards to the environmental education objectives analysis, as you can see, we use the same identified themes or topics and see the presence of these objectives. Uh, most of them went towards the passive objectives, let's say awareness, knowledge, and attitude, and less into the active ones that will be the development of skills or evaluation that was totally absent in, in these uh, objectives. So next one, please. Some of the suggestions that we made out of uh, this analysis based on the textbook's content is the more and better inclusion of environmental topics. The involvement of experts should be considered, um, whether it is environmental educators or ecolinguists that can help with future development of these materials. And it is really important to include more activities that include participation for the environment, whether it is for students and teachers. When referring to teachers, we do like to highlight the role of the teacher when delivering this knowledge and how important it is the training that they need to do so accurately. Some of the approaches that we uh, recommend for this is cooperative learning, positive discourse analysis, and critical pedagogy. In regards to the ecolinguistic perspective uh, for non-human animals, we do recommend, for example, the use of they, she or he instead of it when referring to these non-human animals to avoid objectivization. And in the same way, we do suggest the use of who or whom instead of that or which for the same reasons. It is important that when we talk about non-human animals, they, their portraying of these ones uh, is first and most important about their well-being and uh, we should promote a deep understanding, if possible, about their values and needs. Um, when talking about sustainable diets, what we found in the excerpts were mostly um, animal-based foods. So it is important to highlight that we need to include more plant-based alternatives. It doesn't mean that we need to erase every single example related to animal-based foods because they're still needed for vocabulary or for many other reasons, but it should be at least balanced and justified. So we can start, for example, by including the benefits that will be for health and environment of the consumption of these plant-based alternatives. So now we're going to study number three, that will be presented by Professor Jacobs. Thank you, Ingrid. So this study was a study of a novel published a few years ago called Extremely Bright Creatures. And there are two main characters in the novel, Marcellus, who is a five-year-old octopus who has lived most of his life in an aquarium. And then Tova, a 70-year-old human who cleans the aquarium after closing hours. And sorry to give away the ending, but it's a fairly happy one when Tova helps Marcellus escape from the aquarium and Marcellus helps Tova and her family resolve some of their issues. Because Marcellus is not the usual octopus. He can hear, read, and write English. Some of the positives in the novel are that the sentience, in other words, the intelligence, the emotions, the social needs of Marcellus the octopus, that's acknowledged. Because so often, like Cheng Hao was talking about the civets as machines, not as sentient beings. And another positive is even though the head of the aquarium believes it's okay to keep marine animals in captivity. 
He looks the other way when Marcellus leaves his tank and roams around the aquarium. And he knows that Tova has let Marcellus go, but he doesn't punish her. And in general, the humans are kind to each other and to companion animals like dogs and cats. And this kindness provides a basis for cooperation for change. Just like Ingrid mentioned cooperative learning as a good pedagogy for environmental education. There's also room for improvement because Marcellus is the only non-human animal whose sentience is acknowledged. There's even another octopus in the story, but she is portrayed as not very bright, as just a blob. So in this way, the ideology of anthropocentrism is reinforced. And although the book begins with Marcellus's perspective, the large majority of the story focuses on humans, on Tova's perspective and on the perspectives of the people who she meets. And even when Tova and Marcellus meet, Tova's perspective dominates. In other words, the humans are salient and not the other animals. And you probably heard the term rescued animal. So instead of, buy, instead of buying a new pet, you get a pet who was previously owned by other humans and rescue them. But they, the aquarium director claims that the two octopuses were rescued, but they're not really because they were injured in the wild. They were cured, but they weren't returned to the wild. And yes, there's kindness between humans and other humans and humans and companion animals, but that kindness doesn't extend to other animals. It doesn't extend to the animals in the aquariums, to the animals on the plates in restaurants and in display cases in supermarkets. Their, in, their sentience is erased. And erasure is another kind of story that Stibby talks about. So let's go on to the next part of the presentation and about the benefits of collaboration. And again, we really welcome all of you to collaborate with us in any way that you see fit. So we have more skills to do tasks, such as Cheng Hao is very good at, corp at corpus linguistics. And you saw that in the civet coffee study that, that we did. We get many different ideas to spark even more. We inspire each other. We have more hands to do the work. For example, two of our colleagues weren't able to come today. No worries, because the three of us could fill in for them. Number six, by uh, there's more learning by everyone. And we not only learn about ecolinguistics, about how to do research, but we learn how to work together, which is useful in so many aspects of life. Seven, we have more successors to spread ideas about ecolinguistics. And last but not least, it's more fun to work together. Next, we're going to read a poem written by Alan Maley, who's a famous language educator. And in this poem, there are two voices. The words in bold are by a member of the public, and the words in regular font are by a teacher who wants to change the world. I'll be, I'll be the member of the public, and Cheng Hao will be the teacher. What do you do? I am a teacher. What do you teach? Sorry. What do People. you teach? What do you teach them? English. Oh, you mean grammar, verbs, nouns, pronunciation, conjugation, articles and particles, negatives and interrogatives. Mm, that too. What do you mean, that too? 
Well, I also try to teach them how to think and feel, show them inspiration, aspiration, cooperation, participation, consolation, innovation. Help them think about globalization, exploitation, confrontation, incarceration, discrimination, degradation, and subjugation. How inequality brings poverty, how intolerance brings violence, how need is denied by greed, how ism become poor prisons, how thinking and feeling can bring about healing. Well, I don't know about that. Maybe you should stick to language. Forget about anguish. You can't change the world. But if I did that, I'd be a cheater, not a teacher. Okay, so uh, so many of the presentations that we've heard at this conference very much align with what Alan Maley is saying in this poem. So to conclude, three main points. As everyone knows, addressing the human-created environmental crisis demands everyone's involvement. Second, eco-linguistics gives educators, linguists, and others a powerful tool for their involvement in overcoming the environmental crisis. And last but not least, collaboration enhances the impact eco-linguistics has. If you would like a copy of our presentation, we're very happy to send it to you. And we have more slides than, than we were able to present today. So we're happy to give that to you. And here are, again, are the email addresses for myself, Ingrid and Chung Hao. Thank you very much. And thanks to the organizers. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, such a wonderful presentation. Indeed, your study contributes to the growing body of knowledge in eco-linguistics and promote inter interdisciplinary co collaboration language in shaping environmental perceptions and behavior. Furthermore, thank you for the collaboration as well. As we all know, the collaboration among the teachers from national and international background in research enhances the quality, scope, and impact of education research. Thank you once again. Ladies and gentlemen, now next speaker is Dr. Yasini al Fezi and Ms. Zahra Aliora from Kadiyad University, Marrakesh, Morocco. The topic of presentation is prototype theory, categorization inside in, Morocco, in Moroccan Arabic. Uh, Dr. Yasini Alfezi. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Do you hear me well? Uh, yes, sir. Do you hear me well? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Please Thank go you ahead. so much. Do you see my uh, slides? Yes, sir. So my name is uh, Ilfaizi Yasin. I am a PhD student at Qadayad University. And my presentation is about categorization and it is entitled Prototype Theory Categorization Insights in Moroccan Arabic. This presentation falls within the realm of cognitive linguistics as it's based on a research that investigates the interaction between the human cognition and language in the Moroccan context. So I will start with um, Professor uh, uh, Rush, okay, Rush uh, concerning her studies with uh, Mervis and other scholars. To uh, discuss some Moroccan Arabic words, namely uh, adjectives that express beauty, uh, the noun a bringing, and the verb to cook, and the noun cup, to exemplify how the human mind or cognition categorizes things in its sur surroundings. Uh, the present study is uh, inspired from three main reasons. To start with, categorization is a complex topic since the world consists of different infinite objects between which there are no clear cut boundaries. The second, 
uh, the principles of categorization that both the classical view and the prototype view came up with seem to be insufficient when categorizing different areas of the world. The third reason, the fact that each culture has its own concepts to categorize things and each human mind can differently perceive the world makes categorization also culture bound and sometimes uh, shaped by the individual cognition or the mind blindness. Hence, uh, categories of different objects can be based on different features and principles according to each culture and each human cognition or human mind. So these are the objectives and the, the objectives, questions, and the hypothesis of uh, my uh, study. So let's start with, or let's directly go to the questions. Uh, question number one, does cognition use the same processes, features, and principles that Rush and other scholars mentioned to categorize different areas of the world in distinct languages and cultures? Second question, do we solely talk about human cognition in its general sense when we talk about categorization as a cognitive process? The third question, does categorization solve the problem of fuzziness in the human mind? The hypothesis of this uh, study is a new hypothesis, and it is uh, uh, said like this, cognition is not always collective, but it, it can also be individual and culture-bound. So we move to some uh, key terms definition. Cognition, according to Chiri, 2023, cognition is defined as mental processes that are involved in gaining knowledge and comprehension. Categorization, uh, query and eighth, 2023, defines uh, define categorization as a cognitive process through which we recognize, understand, uh, differentiate and classify the world's objects we are uh, surrounded with. So the human mind, the human mind uses categorization to draw similarities, differences, and boundaries of all objects it interacts with. Individual cognition in the domain of categorization, it refers to the way each individual mind perceives the world, processes information, and uses its uh, uses it to make. Uh, decisions and categorize objects. Cultural cognition refers to the influence of the cultural norms and factors on the individual's perception of the world. In the domain of categorization, the shared cultural norms, practices, and values shape the way the human mind perceives the world, categorizes objects, and tries to set boundaries between categories. Mind blindness in categorization, mind blindness refers to the literary uh, literacy of mind in setting boundaries between categories, which leads to generalization. For instance, many Moroccan people refer to all kinds of fish as fish because they don't know all the categories of fish. Or they refer to all dogs as uh, the category dog without specifying which kind of dog it is. Fuzziness, in the domain of categorization, fuzziness refers to the fact that the boundaries between categories are not clear, clearly uh, defined, which leads to ambiguity and uh, uncertainty. For instance, if we are to say that a dog is an animal, what is an animal then? And if we are to say that an animal is a living thing, what is a living thing? Categorization and abstraction. The most problematic issue with categorization is the notion of abstraction. When I am certain things, as round things or non-around things, I am classifying and categorizing those things in terms of uh, features, for example, roundness. For instance, if we take this attribute of roundness to categorize an apple, apple also can be part of a feature of another thing. Furthermore, if we take the feature of roundness to categorize an apple as a type of the category fruit, what about the other categories which are unrounded but they are considered uh, uh, categories of uh, uh, fruits. And uh, what about tomato, for example? It is rounded, but should we categorize it as a uh, fruit or vegetable? Cognition and categorization. Categorization and cognition are two intertwined concepts. That is, whenever we are talking about categorization, we are talking about some cognitive processes occurring in the human mind. Uh, we move to um, 
uh, the views of, of uh, categorization of theories or theories of categorization we start with the, the classical view it is also known as the uh, Aristotelian category <clears throat> it states that uh, categories are seen as uh, discrete entities characterized by a set of properties which is to be shared by all of their members it is this view is ca characterized uh, by uh, generalization uh, that is to say um, anything or any object which has two uh, two wings feathers and uh, can fly is a bird but what about other objects which uh, have uh, two bird two wings feathers but they can't fly should we categorize them uh, as birds or a uh, non birdish category please the probabilistic view uh, the view of categorization relies on more generalized features and the fuzzy descriptions of categories uh, instead of the specific descriptions needed to classify or categorize an object as an existing category. For instance, foxes and wolves may both belong to the category dog, but there are uh, there is a, a wide difference between them. The prototype view um, refers to the studies that have emerged in the wake of the native revolution of the 1970s by some scholars, such as Rush, K. Lakov, and, and Dillin. And uh, it claims that there, are, there were some problems with the classical view. These problems are listed as follows. For example, the first problem, the criteria of necessary and sufficient conditions uh, are inadequate and are rarely met in categories of naturally occurring items or in human, human sorting of, of experiences. The human beings, uh, categorization is based on Degrees of membership. They consider some members of categories as better members than others. Categories tend to be fuzzy uh, at uh, their boundaries, which are regarded as not clear cuts. Concerning Roche's principles of categorization, we start with the cognitive economy. Um, our minds tend to classify things under broad umbrella terms based on our experience and perception of the world with less cognitive uh, efforts. For example, we classify birds, mammals, and reptiles under the category animal, animal without going deeply to look uh, for the differences between them. The perceived world, stru world structure, uh, our mind tries to classify objects based on how we perceive them. The world surrounding us. For instance, if we take the complex attributes of uh, feathers, fewer and wings, it is an empirical fact provided by the perceived world structure that uh, wings occur with feathers more than with fewer. Common attributes uh, refers to uh, the features that are shared or the characteristics that are shared um, among members of a specific category. Similarity in shape, this principle suggests that objects with similar uh, shapes are often categorized together. For instance, ostrich, swans, and flamingos, or geese and, and ducks. Family resemblances um, refers to the fact that members of a category may, sh may share certain features without having a certain common feature defining all of them. For instance, some games share certain features like competition, rules, winning and losing, enjoyment, etc. But there is no common feature which defines them uh, all. Personal experience and categorization personal e experience refers to each individual's unique perceptions, uh, perspectives, emotions and uh, memories <clears throat> to interpret and classify information. For instance, if we ask someone to categorize a car, he might not uh, just categorize it as that square object uh, with uh, four doors, wheels, seats for both uh, passengers and driver, etc. But he might also uh, categorize it as a first love affair or injury if uh, he had experience in an accident, for example. Communal experience refers to the shared perceptions and interpretations within a community. For instance, some behaviors can be categorized as uh, um, acceptable or unacceptable 
based on some shared traditions, norms, and values. We move to research methodology. This research paper is explanatory since it examines and explains the principles and features on which Moroccans base their classification of concrete and abstract objects surrounding them. To gather adequate data, the researcher targeted different age and gender groups uh, and the, the number of... Yes? Wrap up your presentation as soon as possible because we are running short of time. Please. Okay, I will try to go directly to data discussion. Thank so, <clears throat> these are the adjectives that uh, express beauty in Moroccan uh, Arabic. So, I need to explain to you these the meaning of these adjectives because um, maybe maybe you are not uh, aware of the Moroccan Arabic. I'm not talking about the standard Arabic, but Moroccan Arabic. So we have uh, these uh, adjectives like, for example, Zwina, and uh, it is equivalent uh, to beautiful. It is used for a uh, female person. Zwin, it is uh, equivalent to handsome, and it is used for a boy. Uh, and these adjectives, as we can see uh, here, uh, can be categorized can be categorized on the basis of uh, different uh, features like uh, gender, sexuality, uh, cultural cognition, and individual cognition. For example, the category that you can see uh, on your left, maybe hash, maybe hash, maqbool, maqbool, etc., are, are categorized minus sexual, while the uh, um, adjectives on your right are categorized as plus sexual while the uh, other adjectives uh, in the bottom are categorized either plus sexual or minus sexual of course on the basis of uh, the intention of the speaker which means that we are talking about the individual uh, perception or the individual cognition here but another difference between these uh, adjectives is that some adjectives are, are, are to be used only uh, with the female uh, person. So Moroccan people categorize a beautiful girl as a nutty choke or as a strawberry or as a crystal or as a bullet. And of course, based on some similarities, for example, the harmonious uh, shape of, uh, of a nutty choke, mm -hmm. And uh, it is hard to reach the heart of an artichoke, which is considered the most thing that accounts in it, uh, in it unless if you carefully suffer with peeling away all its leaves that are spinny. Uh, an artichoke is hard to be reaped because it is spinny. And in the Moroccan history, artichokes were cooked and eaten only by some Moroccan fessy people who belong to the high classes or the high class. So Moroccan people may refer to a beautiful girl as uh, an artichoke because it is hard to attain. Maybe the same goes for the adjectives deer, a deer. Uh, they refer to a beautiful girl as deer, uh, Zela, because there are some similarities between a deer and a beautiful girl uh, or a handsome boy. For example, the attractive shape and the skinny body, the large beautiful eyes, in addition to the fact that a deer is hard to be hunted. Moreover, the adjective strawberry is used to describe a beautiful woman or a beautiful girl because it resembles her in its reddish color and because Moroccan people often classify a beautiful girl on the basis of her reddish or rosy cheeks and lips. Of course, we can use Rosh's feature of good and bad examples to categorize the aforementioned Moroccan Arabic adjectives because some of them are considered good adjectives that describe beauty in Moroccan Arabic, but we can also categorize them based on the notions of sexuality, gender, cultural cognition, and individual uh, cognition, as we clearly see um, on the table. So we move to the verb because of time constraints. We move to the verb to cook. As you can see, the the verb to cook is considered as the high, the highest level of abstraction. And there are many other verbs uh, under this verb. For instance, if we say he is cooking meat, so there is abstraction here. Uh, we don't know if he is grilling it 
uh, frying it, steaming it, or boiling it. And of course, uh, Moroccan people categorize uh, verbs that uh, are related to the verb uh, to cook on the basis of procedure and ingredients. And uh, also there are some other, in the Moroccan culture, there are some other uh, uh, objects that can be uh, grilled but cannot be uh, boiled and uh, some other objects which can be grilled, boiled, fried and steamed at the same time. So we move to um, the noun upbringing, which means trabia in Moroccan Arabic, upbringing. And upbringing is the highest level of abstraction. And we have, and in it, we have uh, discernment and manners or mor morals. So um, Moroccan people can uh, categorize uh, a person as plus uh, marbi based on good and respectful way of speaking, as plus marbi means uh, someone who has good manners and morals. Uh, and they can categorize another person uh, as minus marbi, uh, which means someone who doesn't have good manners uh, and morals or doesn't follow the, 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 the protocol uh, on the basis of rude way of speaking. And uh, they can categorize someone as plus adib, as uh, someone who has good behavior, respectful use of body language, respectful way of sitting, respectful manners of eating. And minus adib, which means someone uh, who, is, who is not well uh, abrupt uh, on the basis of uh, this respectful behavior, disrespectful use of body language, disrespectful way of sitting, uh, and dis disrespectful, disrespectful manner of eating. While uh, in the Moroccan culture, people are uh, can be categorized as plus uh, discernment or plus miswab if they follow a uh, certain uh, protocol. For example, if someone uh, who uh, does what he is expected to do and say in a certain circumstance, for example, if you are invited to certain kinds of events, you should bring a gift with you and you should pay attention to what kind of words are you supposed to say in that special circumstance. When someone is hospitalized, for example, you should go and visit him, taking some fruit or food with you, then call and check on his or her health situation and pay him a visit when he is in convalescence, etc. If you follow this protocol and these steps, you are categorized as plasm swab. But if you miss only one step of these steps, you might be categorized as minus uh, swab. Dr. Yasini, so, thank you so much. Yes, we, you. okay, we move directly to the oh, uh, conclusion. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, categorization can be uh, based on other features and principles like purpose, sexuality, procedure, and mind blindness. In addition to those claimed by uh, the classical and the prototype view, cultural and individual cognition play a vital role in categorization. Some other features that categorization can be based on according to this study are those of purpose, sexuality, procedure, and mind blindness. We may share a certain area of cognition to deal with the outside world as human beings, but we might also differ in some other areas of cognition that are peculiar to culture and individuals. There are three types of cognition, which are human cognition, cultural cognition, and individual cognition. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry for not going deeply in discussing things because of time constraints. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Yasin El Fezi. Yes, these are uh, the differences. Thank gentlemen, you. our next presenters are Mr. Bin Chin, uh, Dr. Shao Shui Li, and Dr. Hogging Liu, Suzhou University, Suzhou, Jiangsu, China. The topic of presentation is exploring the productive role of self efficacy in engagement among EFL teachers in online teaching, a mediation of buoyancy. I invite Mr. Bin Chin to present his topic. Thank you so much. So, can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, now um, allow me to share my screen first. Okay, sir. So, you can share your screen. Yeah. So, can you see my screen? 
Okay, very good. Um, so good day, ladies and gentlemen. I am really grateful for this opportunity to present a study here on foreign language teacher psychology in online teaching contexts. My presentation is based on our teamwork paper, um, which has recently been published online. If you are interested in this paper, you can find it for more information in the journal, the Asia Pacific Education Researcher. So first of all, first of all, I would like to begin with the context of this research. Um, so in 2019, the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic put the whole world in crisis. All aspects of our life were under huge impacts, including that of language teachers. In some situations, um, such as quarantine and ep epidemic control, uh, classroom teaching lost uh, its feasibility. To address this postponement of education, China's government issued a policy that is suspending classes without stopping learning, advocating for a nationwide application of online teaching. As a result of emergencies and educational policies, online teaching served as a useful tool when face-to-face -face offline instruction was impossible. Unfortunately, this um, sudden transition from traditional face-to-face -face instruction to remote online teaching has brought forth um, various challenges for teachers, including the lack of knowledge of online teaching and information literacy, constrained teacher-student interaction, increased workload, etc. And these changes and challenges in turn affected teachers' professional development and their emotional experiences. So regarding the impacts on teacher psychology due to the shift in teaching modes, um, Researchers have investigated EFL teachers' psychological changes in the online environment, such as anxiety and resilience. Besides those explored variables, and um, teacher, uh, teachers with high self-evaluations of their competence and a buoyant psychological state tend to overcome emerging difficulties with ease, and their effective coping with everyday setbacks may contribute to a greater investment of time and energy in online language teaching. To extend the research scope of studies on online teacher psychology, we investigated their self-efficacy, buoyancy, and work engagement, together with their relationships in this study. The major purpose is to gain a better understanding of teachers' psychological factors and their experiences in this unique form of language teaching, and to provide references for improving future online instruction. So now let's have a quick glance at these variables. Self-efficacy is teachers' self-perception of their competence in undertaking specific tasks to provide effective instru instruction. In online language instruction, this factor figures prominently in that teachers' effective strategy adoption, student engagement facilitation, and technology application together contribute to smooth online classroom progress. As I have mentioned, teachers have to face new challenges when teaching online. They are supposed to develop the ability to overcome recurring problems that are ordinary in online instruction, such as network signal failure and device breakdown, and maintain a, a resilient, resilient state of mind. And this ability is termed as buoyancy. Since efficacious and buoyant teachers tend to achieve a more positive and promising state of work, their teaching performance may be enhanced. This, um, this improvement is very closely related to the concept of work engagement, which involves energy willingness and resilience while working, a sense of enthusiasm, excitement, and involvement in work, and for immersion in work. In our attempt to pin down their relationships, we have consulted um, some related studies. So for the relationship between self-efficacy and buoyancy, some studies have identified that self-efficacious teachers tended to become more buoyant in both traditional and online teaching settings. At the same time, the predictive role of self-efficacy together with its indirect influences on work engagement has also been confirmed.
So Andrew J. Martin with his co-researchers also found the impact on work engagement from buoyancy. Although these studies have made meaningful attempts to uncover the relationships between these three psychological variables, few have made further exploration in online settings. In addition to empirical studies on teacher psychology, the broaden and build theory proposed by Fredrickson also provides us with references to put forward the hypothesized model for the three variables. This theory highlights the tremendous power of positive emotions in improving individuals' performance by broadening their mom momentary thought action repertoires and building their enduring personal resources. On the basis of this notion, teachers with positive feelings, such as feeling confident in their online teaching skills and remaining positive when encountering um, signal failure may be more likely to uh, solve these difficulties and become more psychologically and emotionally and physically um, engaged in teaching language online. So we put forward the four hypotheses of this study together with the, the hypothesized model for teacher self-efficacy, buoyancy and work engagement in online teaching. So in our study, we invited a convenient sample of 978 high school English language teachers in China to join our study to explore the profile of their self-efficacy, buoyancy, and work engagement. We adopted three scales, namely online, te online teacher self-efficacy survey, workplace uh, buoyancy scale, and the U-check to work engagement scale. The reliability of each scale was acceptable and several items were removed to achieve satisfactory model fits. The descriptive analysis showed that those teacher participants experienced high levels of self-efficacy, buoyancy, and work engagement when teaching the English language online. Besides, the three variables are in significant and positive correlation. To further examine their relationship, we assessed the the direct and indirect paths from self-efficacy to work engagement via buoyancy through structural equation modeling. The final model is displayed in the in the PowerPoint in the in the next page. The model fit was accept was acceptable. The results revealed that both self-efficacy and buoyancy could be significant predictors of work engagement, and self-efficacy could indirectly influence work engagement via buoyancy. This is the final model. Um, so our findings have confirmed the predictive role of self-efficacy in buoyancy, which is supported by prior studies, indicating that teachers with positive feelings about their teaching capability tend to display more skillful handling of problems that occur in uh, online classrooms. They, will, they are able to improve their technical technological pedagogical content knowledge, uh, TPACK, and create a dynamic online classroom atmosphere that facilitate uh, online interaction in order to mitigate the shortcomings of online language teaching. Even though the emergency situation and new requirements for language teachers have brought them um, tough tasks, they will not be overwhelmed be by online teaching stress or let one single failure um, discourage them. Regarding the relationship between self-efficacy and work engagement, our finding is supported by is also supported by previous studies. According to the Broaden and the Bill theory and the social cognitive theory, individuals with high levels of self-efficacy tend to become more committed to their work. So when teaching online, EFL teachers who are confident in their competence and experience expect a successful online language classrooms will invest more time and energy in online classes and their profession. The results of prior research on the effect of buoyancy on work engagement have also been confirmed in our study. The essence of buoyancy is related to pers um, prospective anticipation of effective uh, problem solving 
And according to the control value theory proposed by Pecron, um, ex uh, expectancies that an activity can be successful, successfully performed and lead to outcomes what, that one wants to attain may contribute to positive emotions, which will in turn improve one's performance. So buoyant, um, buoyant teachers who anticipate successful online teaching experiences and effective handling of everyday setbacks tend to become more immersed in this job. In addition, our study addresses the gap concerning the indirect path from self-efficacy to work engagement, because previous studies mainly focused on the relationships between two of these three variables. And our attempt helps us to understand the mechanism between self-efficacy, buoyancy, and engagement. Self-efficacious self teachers hold positive evaluations of their online teaching and their competence. Their positive and, positive and resilient defense against the common challenges in online settings, such as, um, such as uh, scant student um, engagement and limited teacher-student interaction, and adopting uh, effective strategies to solve problems. This challenging but successful experience of handling setbacks in turn enables teachers to be more engaged in their work. So we have several implications for both researchers and EFL teacher training programs. Um, so first, um, teachers' psychological states should gain attention from training programs to optimize work outcomes in that they will commonly encounter challenges and arouse negative emotions that may hinder their, uh, their work engagement. Second, uh, considering the, the direct and indirect influences of self-efficacy, it is imperative to foster positive attitudes toward their own pedagogical knowledge and skills. One possible approach is to highlight their successful ex experiences in dealing with difficulties. Besides, the mediation role of buoyancy highlights the importance of nurturing EFL teachers' capability to tackle daily difficulties in both traditional and online teaching in a teaching practice. Our study also has uh, several limitations, such as um, the data, data type and research design. Um, further studies may use observational data to provide a more complete picture of EFL teachers. Uh, a longitudinal design may also help in recording the fluctuations in teacher psychology. In addition, qualitative and mixed, uh, and mixed research methods are also helpful in achieving a comprehensive profile of their complex psychological ex experience. Um, to sum up, Teacher psychology is crucial to successful implementation of both traditional and online lang language teaching. Attention should be paid to fostering teachers' positive emotions and ped pedagogical skills to ensure the continuous development of both teachers and students. That's all for my today's presentation. Hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable insight on one of the very important aspects in teaching learning that is self-efficacy and buoyancy. Ladies and gentlemen, now we're going to begin our question and answer sessions. We have some questions for our speakers from the audience. So the course, first question is for uh, Dr. Humaira Irfan. <coughs> okay. Um, the course, first question is for Dr. Humaira Irfan. Ma'am, the question is, you have mentioned the confusion among the English teachers. How do you propose addressing this confusion? providing the necessary training for the teachers to effectively teach creative writing. Dr. Humaira. Jia Samlika, thank you very much for this uh, question. So uh, I'm glad to receive this question, very important question. So the purpose of my study was basically, it was a kind of, uh, uh, it was not just a research, but a kind of a mini workshop for English language teachers who teach creative writing. So uh, they need to, first of all, they, they should know, like I published a book on testing creative writing in Pakistan in 2018. 
and the findings that I received uh, from about uh, 100 uh, English language teachers who are teaching creative writing in schools as well as in colleges and universities. So they were not doing the real justice to creative writing. So they were not familiar with the various approaches which are used for teaching creative writing. In fact, they said that in Pakistan, we do not have a concept of creative writing, particularly uh, for high school and for intermediate students, those students, and we know that we have in fact, around 200,000 students, if we just take the example of uh, Lahore board, they appear and uh, they their focus is textbooks. Their focus is not creative writing. So I decided that uh, first of all, I will myself produce a book on creative writing. So the genre that I selected was poetry. And because I, I believe that those teachers who are themselves uh, cre good creative writers, they can teach uh, creative writing uh, students quite effectively. I hope I'm able to answer this question. So much, ma'am. So no. the question is quite wide. Thank so, you. Yes. Okay. And I believe that the English language teachers definitely need training to teach creative writing. Okay. It's neither a skill that is naturally learned nor a skill that can be taught quite without any training on the part of English teachers. Thank you so much, ma'am. My dear audience, we will provide you with the email of Dr. George Jacob. So you may ask questions sending him directly. So I formally invite Dr. Humair Irfan, chair of this session, for her concluding remarks. Please, Dr. Humair Irfan. Thank you very much for inviting me to chair this session. I extend warm congratulations to all wonderful presenters from Pakistan, Nigeria, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Morocco, and China for highly impressive and insightful presentations. The researchers, in short, presented interesting data related to their own specific context. The findings on crucial contemporary language issues are persuasive, credible, valuable, and have significant impact. I'm sure that these talks have definitely enhanced the knowledge of research scholars, enriched their vision, and broadened their exposure to international research community. Thank you very much, and congratulations to the Department of English of Prefa International University for organizing very successful conference. Thank you so much, ma'am. And once again, thank you so much, dear presenters. With this, we come to the end of our session. There is going to be a lunch break of one hour. We will begin our next session at 2 p.m., inshallah. Thank you so much.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. I, Nabila Javed, welcome you all to the last session of day two of ICAL. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce our esteemed chair and first keynote speaker for this session, Dr. Iram Amjad. She is serving as assistant professor at FAST National University of Emerging Sciences, Lahore, Pakistan. Dr. Amjad has specialized in diverse methods and topics in forensic linguistics from Aston University, UK. Her research interests include forensic linguistics, applied linguistics, critical discourse analysis, legal discourse, and manifestation of language and gender in the criminal justice system. I invite Dr. Iram Amjad to speak on the topic, Fallacious Reasoning in Legal Argumentation, a Linguistic Analysis of Solicitors' Criminal Trials. Over to you, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues and dear scholars, before I delve into the intricacies of my research in forensic linguistics, I want to acknowledge the profound influence of my mentor, Dr. Muhammad Shaban, for fostering my passion for applied linguistics. It is with immense gratitude that I stand before So let me share the screen first. All right. The topic of my research is the fallacious reasoning in legal argumentation, a linguistic analysis of solicitors' strategies in criminal trials. So in the realm of uh, the legal discourse, the intricacies of fallacious reasoning often play a pivotal role. And today I will talk about the fallacious reasoning in legal argumentation, specifically focusing on the linguistic analysis of the solicitor's strategies in those criminal trials. The use of logic through language is not a new concept in legal discourse. The core of this research lies in unveiling the strategic employment of linguistic elements that underpin fallacious reasoning, a method that can sway the direction of a trial, impacting the delivery of justice. So solicitors often use a variety of argumentative strategies to protect their clients. And these fallacies range from the formal to informal, Formal will be talking about the errors in logical structure and informal are those missteps in argument content. And these are basically the rhetorical strategies which are instrumental in navigating the trial's outcome. So central to the inquiry is the understanding that fallacies in legal argumentation are uh, do not exist in a vacuum. They interact with socio legal context and personal bias and this role in logic construction of their narratives. Throughout my presentation, uh, my team uncovered and elicited their influence on the legal validity and soundness. For this criminal trial uh, transcripts from high courts of the main division Uh, I think. Ma'am, please continue. We can hear you. Certain comments that you're making. As far as the theoretical uh, lens is concerned, uh, DHA discourse historical approach uh, suggests that they can be identified and analyzed within the disco disco legal discourse as rhetorical strategies to persuade or to manipulate audiences. So fallacies may manifest in various forms, including logical inconsistencies, deceptive reasoning, or manipulative language, and their presence in discourse can influence the interpretation and reception of arguments. Within the context of criminal trials in Pakistan, Resigal and Vodak's approach would likely involve examining how 
fallacies are used by solicitors to construct and advance their arguments, as well as how they contribute uh, to shape the uh, legal proceedings. So overall, this uh, framework uh, and theoretical lens uh, provides a methodological approach for understanding how fallacies operate within the legal discourse, thereby having broader implications for social and political processes. The solicitors employ various uh, um, fallacies uh, as uh, indicated in this flow chart. First of all, the solicitors use a fallacious argument to persuade the judge, which include narratives based on logical fallacies and rhetorical errors, either as intentional uh, form of trick or unintentional uh, as a form of deception, flawed reasoning. The first uh, fallacy is associative evidence. Here, the solicitor's narrative revolves around the important forensic evidence from the crime scene, that is shoe print. The Lexeme shoe is repeated four times to emphasize and figure out the probability that footwear impression at the crime scene was similar to cheetah shoes found at the Q's house, but the content in solicitor's argument was off kilter as the fallacy suggested importance of shoe match despite the common of those shoes, their sizes, and the sole patterns. The next one is anecdotal evidence. It is evident, right, that how the solicitors in the beginning is using, um, you know, persuasive strategy by using words of negation like irrelevant for associative evidence of blood type matching characteristics. The center of attention in the whole argument was the lexeme blood and its accessibility in the overall population of Punjab and the city where the crime took place. So he specified the characteristics of the blood type, which were used as evidence by the adjective rare to reinforce the linguistic symbol of blood from general. And like one person of the population in Punjab has this rare blood type with a population of 11 million. So this blood type would be found in around 3,000 people here we see that the defense fallacy used an anecdotal uh, evidence as you know uh, uh, the uh, the reason to construct the accused as innocent as 11 matches out of 11 million were expected and there was no likelihood of the accused to be guilty other than the other matches uh, the solicitors were also found using informal fallacies. So um, there is a linguistic space in law that deals with the inquiry of factual issues for which the solicitors construct arguments based on the narratives of the witnesses and clients. And here is uh, the first example uh, affirming a uh, disjunct, like the solicitors constructed his argument based on a fallacy that stemmed from descriptive statement, this relationship of a husband, as well as the propositional logical assertion spots color of lipstick on his shirt to be inclusive. For this purpose, the confusion of the argument does not follow from the premise as the disjunct that if a husband tells the wife he didn't go to another woman, which is adverbial, if, for example, honestly, uh, if her husband tells his wife, so we see that uh, the uh, he added evidence to the deliberation that was not considered fragment of the propositional content, but linked the sentence with the previous narrative. The two interrogative forms, like what else could you expect? With a credible version of events in support of his narrative. Next, we have begging the question as an informal fallacy, uh, which is evident uh, like uh, the prosecution solicitor employed rhetorical technique of storm and uh, uh, the uh, fallacy of uh, begging the question. And this is characteristic example of circular argument in which the conclusion is that asserting the act cannot be impartial. And the proposition is that injustice of killing first wife cannot be remedied due to the reason for marrying another woman that is just due to the acceptance at first place. The third one is the straw man fallacy uh, by pronouncing the husband guilty. Again, the husband wife relation is manifested as full of acrimony by using the language of bitterness. Husbands will be encouraged to murder their wives. So since the prosecutor previously inquired about the feeling about killing his client's wife without evidence, so he further reiterated the same analogy of defendant's guilt, otherwise more criminal actions might be expected. Next uh, is the appeal to ages. The criminal courts in Punjab did not exclude fallacies that appeal to ages of wisdom of the ancient as uh, uh, propounded by Vodak. 
in the framework and the long established standards customs of the society so solicitor employed the two collocation long tradition and light beating to establish the link between uh, the customary law and punjabi socio cultural norms the solicitor's language of violence is pertinent here as the lexemes for instance beats beating hitting describe the act of striking with repeated blows to injure something but the uh, the solicitors drew the semantic meaning of the lexical items as analogous to pacifism, not a crime, does not mean violence. So he intentionally omitted some discursive constructions of violence to nullify the physical violence. Last uh, informal fallacy is the hasty generalization for the shift of guilt in the murder trial proceeding. Here the solicitor made stereotypical claims about women's interest in men by overstating her involvement in them without sufficient evidence. For example, the lady cook was not sincere with him. It is not clear as to how it supported the claim. Rather, the solicitor resorted to guesswork as there were no concrete linguistic details about the subtle signals indicating women's interest in men. Because women use, you know, subtle cues like and covert strategies like eye contact, eyebrow flashing, uh, open body gesture and smiling to signal interest in men, of which nothing was indicated by the solicitor as an evidential support in his argument in the court. Even if it was true that this woman was flirt in nature, the cook, I'm talking about the lady cook, but there are many other cases in which this is not the case. So this is implied in the generalization. In fact, women become emotional, but glossed over in the first hasty generalization. But the point is, for example, women's general tendency to involve women. So the particular case of lady cook was taken to oversimplify it for all the women residing in Punjab. Further, this overgeneralized assumption was taken to an extreme level by him to propose the scene like sentence to death by lapidation on the basis of socio-legal references like Hadood ordinance and laws on fornication. The solicitor here strategically employed intertextual narrative links between an ordinary story of a woman and religious obligations and legal implications of adultery. For this, he used predictive conditional if where the consequence clause were must be sentenced to death by stoning, specified what followed from the necessary condition if the person is a Muslim to shift the burden of guilt to the lady cook. Uh, in addition, the solicitor also used the um, linguistic modality uh, that must be you know, sentenced to death by rajim. Uh, according to the criminal law and some standard behavior to manifest Lady Cook's aberrant crime, thereby suggesting correct course of action in the form of death sentencing by stoning. Uh, to conclude my presentation, uh, this study underscores the importance of linguistic competence in the legal arena. It posits that an awareness and understanding of malicious reasoning are crucial for all legal practitioners and this understanding not only assists in identification and reconstruction of flawed arguments, in the form of fallacies that also promote a more rational and equitable re legal process. Uh, this study also illuminates the ways in which fallacious reasoning rooted in linguistic practices can shape the trajectories of criminal trials in Pakistan. Uh, the study's implications are profound, uh, suggesting the need for enhanced legal education, focusing on legal reasoning and argumentation skills. It also highlights the potential for improved judicial training to recognize and mitigate the impact of Felicious reasoning in legal proceedings. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, ma'am. We truly appreciate your expertise and effort for highlighting the need for legal education, focusing on logical reasoning and argumentation skills. Dear audience, our second keynote speaker is Dr. Huma Batul. She is an assistant professor in the Department of English at Air University, Islamabad. Besides her doctoral specialization in cognitive linguistics and language processing in autism, other areas of her research interest include cognitive semantics, cognitive poetics, language, space, and cognition, cognitive discourse analysis, and psychoneurolinguistics. Her topic for the presentation is neuroimaging information about language recovery in aphasia. Over to you, ma'am. Am I audible? Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And to begin with, um, my special thanks to the organizers, to the focal persons of the 
conference and then uh, of course the university itself for arranging such a wonderful uh, and of course timely conference and thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts on uh, one of the works that I did with one of my students. It, it is actually a part of it that we did with reference to one of the neuroimaging techniques. All right, now, um, what can neuroimaging inform about language recovery in aphasia? So to begin with, let's just see what is uh, aphasia actually. So, and then what are the types and the causes of this aphasia? So, um, yes, so it's a language disorder that affects person's ability to communicate. It can be classified into Broca's aphasia, Wernicke's aphasia, and global aphasia. Now, these are the overarching names, but then if you further go into the details, there are specific kinds of aphasia. Each type is actually specified by difficulties in speaking and understanding or both. Now, for example, as you can just see here, if it's the Wernicke's area that gets affected in green, so there is problem with reference to understanding and processing of the speech. But if this Broca's area gets affected, then of course Broca's aphasia, aphasia would take place, affecting the speech production. Now, the main causes are generally stroke, tumors, traumatic brain injury, and degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, but the uh, worst thing is that, of course, they do affect the language uh, uh, processing areas, leading to language impairment. And when it comes to language recovery, of course, it involves various cognitive and neural mechanisms, which uh, through language uh, and speech therapy sessions, of course, can never be seen. For this neuroimaging techniques, they are very important to actually see uh, what was the brain structure and function before the recovery process and uh, what uh, which kind of changes took place after the recovery process. Now, with the reference to aphasia, we have generally it happens in the older people, but then childhood aphasia does exist. Now, in childhood aphasia, more or less the, the uh, causes are the same, but then the way they are classified as expressive, receptive, and mixed aphasia, uh, with reference to expressive aphasia, of course, production gets effective, affected. With reference to receptive aphasia, comprehension, and in some cases, both gets affected. And with reference to childhood aphasia, there, there are two things that we have to keep in mind. Uh, there is developmental ch childhood aphasia, which is referred to as congenital aphasia. And the second one is acquired aphasia, where children in the beginning, they acquire language, the way the milestones of the language are achieved in neurotypicals. But then because of any kind of brain injury, stroke, or any kind of thing, they uh, um, uh, unfortunately happen to have acquired aphasia. Now, other reasons in the children can be uh, epilepsy, uh, can be the uh, autism spectrum disorder, and then certain other neurodevelopmental disorders that can lead to the development of aphasia at the same time. So, of course, uh, if the children, they do face challenges with reference to the milestones of the language, and that also affects their educational achievement and social interaction. So the, the point is that timely speech and language therapies can lead to neurocognitive recovery, but the problem is this is one of the gaps here in Pakistan that with reference to childhood aphasia, children, they rarely get diagnosed with uh, childhood aphasia, whether it's congenital or acquired. So of course that leads to further delays and then children, uh, the, the parents of the children, they are not aware of it. That's why speech and therapy sessions uh, or the therapies, they do not take place in time. Now, uh, when it, with reference to the literature, neuroimaging techniques, they're actually uh, highlighted as uh, important tools to look at the patterns and the nature of language recovery in aphasia. And uh, Kiran and Thompson also highlighted that how combining neuroimaging techniques with the intervention studies can actually help us look at the language recovery patterns in the children with uh, aphasia and then the same can be applied to uh, the older people so this is actually where uh, my study comes in but before talking about this we, we actually combined uh, one of the neuroimaging techniques that samurai i'll talk about that with uh, slp's uh, uh, speech language pathology sessions uh, before and 
after the sessions. Now, generally, there are these three neuroimaging techniques, MRIs, we're aware of them. Um, they, they, this is a structural way of looking at the brain. fMRI, which is hardly available in Pakistan, but then, of course, it looks at the functions of the brain. And then EEG, we are well aware of it, that how electrodes are placed, and then you can look at the brain activity. So these three different neuroimaging techniques have been used worldwide to study the aphasia and then the recovery patterns in the aphasia. And what are the important findings uh, with reference to whatever has been done? That it can help us look at the language function, that which specific areas of the brain they're actually active and then which to be worked on. Uh, it helps us look at the lesion size. So now uh, lesion is the defect area. So if the Broca's area and the Wernicke's area, or is it that both are affected? So it actually helps us look at that. And then uh, it also helps us look at the efficacy of the treatments and the language interventions that are uh, conducted by clinical psychologists and SLP speech language pathologists. And last but not the least, neuroplastic changes. Now, with reference to this third one, um, and the treatment efficacy and neuroplastic changes, we actually conducted the study. So uh, neuroplasticity refers to the brain's ability to reorganize itself. So this is what we actually looked at, that how before the therapy sessions and after the therapy sessions, was there any uh, important um, you know, change in the structure of the brain uh, with reference to learning and experience? So it's just like when the brain is, uh, when the when those SLPs, uh, they actually um, conducted those therapy sessions, they metaphorically speaking, this is what they were actually doing with the brains of the children to help them reorganize and then uh, rehabilitate the, the neural patterns that got uh, disconnected or affected. Now, we used MRI for that because uh, in Pakistan, this is something which is comparatively, of course, available and manageable, keeping in mind the cost and certain other limitations. So um, this is the, the clinical settings, of course, it, it actually helps us look at the abnormalities and the brain function and can help us diagnose this. So for the current study that we conducted, especially with reference to this, we actually explored uh, the uh, structural ch changes of the brains of two children who were diagnosed with congenital aphasia, which is developmental aphasia. It, it means that by birth, they had this problem. So um, they underwent this MRI. So the pre and post therapy MRI scans, they were compared and uh, the study showed explicit neuroplasticity in both the children. I'm sorry, I won't be able to show the, the exact brain images here uh, because uh, the paper is still in, in the review process. So I can't share the exact findings. Uh, but of course, we were able to actually see the with the help of a neurologist. We had to take a neurologist on board. We had to take an SLP on board and all the MRI um, scans, they were... Uh, explained and interpreted by that neurologist and then he told us that how uh, there was marked difference in the structure of the brain especially with reference to uh, their language specific areas so of course these findings we believe have important implications for the neuro rehabilitation uh, if we talk about pakistan we are still at the very you know infancy stage initial stage of just uh, looking at the uh, at uh, uh, or uh, the the acknowledging and then uh, having this awareness that yes we we do have these language and uh, communication disorders but then we have to move a step further to actually combine this neurology with the language uh, um, uh, speech and language pathology which is clinical psychology and slp and linguistics so i think um, with uh, in the light of the findings we can see that this is how, if we just look at the brain, uh, the, the structure of the brain with reference to the language skills that were taught. So we can actually um, inform not only clinical psychology, but then also um, the, the neuro rehabilitation uh, with a reference to this. Of course, every study has challenges and limitations. Same as the case for uh, the neuroimaging. Why? Because uh, every brain is different. Every learning experience is different. Even if the the same kind of environment was provided for both the children. They had uh, a little bit different structural um, changes, but then changes they did take place with reference to their language recovery. So overall, we believe that, of course, it does talk about the effectiveness of uh, speech and language therapy. And that was 
we kind of testified through these uh, brain um, images that yes, speech and language therapy sessions as intervention can really help, but then it can further inform the clinical um, the clinical research in the dimensions that where exactly and how exactly speech and language sessions can be, um, you know, adopted and adapted for for further neuro rehabilitation of of the client. So uh, the advantages uh, are definitely it helps us look at the invaluable uh, insights, generally speaking, with reference to the neuro rehabilitation and uh, linguistics, for example. Then, of course, when there are detailed images, uh, functional data is there. You can actually see in the uh, in the runtime uh, sometimes, and then as as an evidence that yes, the the change did take place. Uh, it does have its limitations, especially with reference to Pakistan as third world country, cost, accessibility, plus ethical considerations that whether parents they are actually willing to first acknowledge that yes, their children they have some problem, and then um, kind of uh, you know encouraging them, counseling them to take them to speech and language pathology uh, sessions and then to have these MRI scans, of course, ethical considerations. Uh, I know in Pakistan, we're still struggling with this, but I think we um, uh, we can, with the help of uh, these kinds of you know platforms, the way it is provided to me here, we can just talk about these things and can encourage our um, young researchers to actually opt for these kinds of researches and um, with reference to the importance definitely it can help research findings and advances in the knowledge of the brain and of course language and the brain and the challenges that i've already talked about but then there is one another challenge that we find out that in pakistan um, the specialized assessment tools and intervention strategies with reference to the ethically and linguistic linguistically diverse population is still scarce. We really need to, um, the, the, our clinical psychologists, our speech language pathologists, they really need to, I think, uh, develop a culturally and linguistically appropriate assessment measures, a language assessment batteries for children with aphasia in Pakistan. Future directions and potential implications, of course, uh, in the, the neural mechanisms of underlying language recovery. Now, cutting edge, edge uh, imaging tools um, to monitor real-time brain changes. Now, this is, of course, still uh, an ideal situation in Pakistan, but at least the way we did, we started off with just an MRI. I think uh, we, we can move forward. And then clinical interventions, um, the developing targeted treatments besides targeted assessments can, uh, can be possible through these kinds of researches. So, uh, especially with reference to the clinical practice, I think um, neuroimaging techniques to tailor interventions for each patient, depending upon their cognitive uh, profiles, and then evidence-based practices, as I mentioned earlier, so that they can make um, authentic clinical decisions during therapy and planning. And then professional training of these kinds of uh, people who are involved is definitely important so that they can further enhance their uh, neuro rehabilitation programs. So um, these uh, three takeaways, integration of modality, uh, modalities definitely, I think this is high time in Pakistan where we talk about interdisciplinary research. We need to uh, move a step forward. And instead of just doing linguistic researches, I think we must uh, take on board neurologists, speech language pathologists, and clinical psychologists, make a research team uh, so that we can actually start working on uh, same or similar researches uh, with reference to interdisciplinary collaboration so that whatever we are doing ha has a productive outcome uh, so that whatever our, our research findings, they can be translated into uh, practical solutions for diverse populations. That's all from my side. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, ma'am, for emphasizing the important aspects of neuroimaging, aligning it with the language learning conditions at aphasia. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Dr. Ibrahimova Sahila Rafiq. She is from Azerbaijan State Pedagogical University, Azerbaijan. Her topic is Phonosemantics of Lexical Categories in the Azerbaijani Language. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, hello. 
uh, I am greeting all of you. Uh, I am uh, greeting uh, our brother country, Pakistan. Um, uh, thank you, the conference uh, organization for organizing su uh, such a wonderful conference and for inviting me uh, to this, this conference. I am very pleased to meet you in here. Uh, I would like uh, to say that my English is not perfect. If I made some mis mistakes, I am sorry about them. Uh, one minute. Uh... Uh, for the semantic uh, of lexical uh, categories in Azerbaijan uh, language. The interest uh, in the semantics uh, of speech sounds and in research can uh, conduct in this direction attracts attention by the multidirectional nature and the uh, use of various approaches. This Yes, uh, we are in the fox of attention from uh, ancient times. Uh, exactly um, the aims and uh, tasks of the research study uh, study is um, is to determine of the phonosemantic um, Protectors of the lexical categories in Azerbaijan language, as well as such a uh, use as the influence of the phonosemantics uh, uh, on the uh, paradigmatic uh, uh, relations of words. Uh, in the article of the main problems, it's determine context and structure. Uh, Related of the phonosemantics of lexical categories in Azerbaijan language, and uh, to the independent and analysis semantic features of speech sounds in Azerbaijan language and semantic features of um, Azerbaijan language, and um, sorry. In uh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, in article, um, uh, sorry. Um, the article is was uh, wrote um, methods of uh, descriptive, comparative, and cognitive and uh, system uh, analysis uh, were used in this uh, study. Uh, um, since uh, this study, um, a lot of some uh, comparisons with language different. Uh, genealogies and comparative methods and also as uh, in today's of uh, today's speech um, the um, facts uh, obtained while uh, studying of the phonosemantic of lexical categories uh, are the um, are the valuable uh, search in uh, the analysis of um, cognitive uh, linguistic uh, pragmatic features at the uh, lexical level as well as uh, uh, creation uh, of the uh, sound. Uh, crops uh, which is the parts of the national language will be uh, touched um, upon and uh, I have tried to uh, uh, conduct a serious research. Thank you for attention. Uh, thank you for organizing this conference. Thank you very much, ma'am, for providing us a significant perspective regarding the phonosemantic features and its influence on paradigmatic relations of words. Dear audience, our next presenter is Mr. Muhammad Ibrahim from Air University, Islamabad. 
The topic of his presentation is English for Sale, Advertising the Legitimate Language. Over to you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, uh, today, my topic of presentation is English for Sale, uh, Advertising the Legitimate Language. Uh, first of all, uh, let me explain this uh, the topic English for sale uh, it is like uh, we are uh, exploring this is this is basically my uh, mphil thesis and in this thesis we are exploring the new liberal perspectives uh, related to english language that how english language is dealt as a commodity and that is sold in the market uh, and also students and the self entrepreneurs buy it uh, and the next is uh, advertising the legitimate language how the organizations are the institutions that are selling the English language. So how they advertise the legitimate language, the language that is the student outside, like that is that are uh, they are having, that is not legitimate, so buy the legitimate language. Um, this thesis is supervised by Dr. Sham Heather, Associate Professor of Linguistics. So let's see what is new liberalism uh, and how it affects the uh, abstract things like languages and cultures around us. So new liberal ideologies have transformed a languages from language as a tool of communication to language as a commodity and a source of power. A language is dealt as a commodity uh, in a perspectives and new liberal perspectives. And uh, it is also uh, considered as a source of power because people, all those people who have it, so they are ex exercising power in the form of academia or in the form of uh, like social prestige it has transformed language policies and linguistic practices to draw profit from it. Uh, linguistic commodifications, as we talked about that uh, new liberal ideologies commodify things, commodify cultures, commodify languages, uh, all these things. So what is this commodification phenomena? This was, uh, this is uh, like a phenomenon in which languages have economic value of demand and supply like other tangible commodities in the market. Uh, and this commodification, since uh, this new liberal perspectives create inequalities, like those people who have the uh, uh, money they can invest on themselves or they can buy this uh, language for themselves. And so they get the uh, opportunity in the job market. So it creates inequalities. So the individuals, this inequality makes the individuals self-entrepreneurs. That is, they invest on themselves in order to make themselves uh, themselves like uh, equitable to the other people in the market. So, uh, so how this new liberalism works? This new liberalism is basically backed by the globalization. That is the norms and values that are um, moving through globalization and uh, making the other people self entrepreneurs and also providing opportunities to the organization to behave like uh, uh, the market and to sell this language. Due to globalization, cultural boundaries are receding. That is, cultures are intermixing with each other. Like if we look, so uh, uh, this English language, now this is considered as a global lingua franca. And now uh, this is not, uh, uh, this language is not the centralized language. Like uh, English is not belonging, not only to the uh, peoples that are living in the US or to the, uh, are in the UK, but now it is considered like a common language. Why it is like so, it is due to globalization. And demand for English language, like English is a national language, overcome other languages in the linguistic market. So English language is, uh, it's like a killer language. It's eating other languages. Uh, and because, why it is uh, like so? Because it's up, uh, it, there is a prestige attached with the English language. The term of the market was first introduced by Borgio, uh, who was a French sociologist. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, according to him, the languages are in competition with each other. And similarly, the legitimate, legitimate language was also, this term was also introduced by Piri Borgio. And according to him, that is a legitimate language that is imposed and accepted by society by maintaining the symbolic power of the language. Now we come uh, how 
uh, English is uh, seen in the linguistic market of Pakistan. So uh, in Pakistan, English is a, have a high value in our market. And there are several reasons for this because we have a colonial legacy. Uh, beside that, English uh, is a global language. They, uh, by global language, I mean that the all the information, the entertainment that is in English, uh, and English is an imperial language. Thus, indigenous languages are in static maintenance. Static maintenance means that they are not moving forward. So <clears throat> now, since my uh, this thesis is about that how English is commodified, so uh, there are uh, institutions like coaching academies. Uh, who provide the education uh, uh, in the spare time to the students. Uh, in educational terms, it is called the shadow education. So these academies uh, um, uh, appeal to the students and make the students to invest on themselves in order to gain uh, English language as a symbolic power and then to convert that symbolic power to economic capital and social capital. Uh, to social capital, I mean that due to the English language, they will be able to go abroad or they will be able to uh, get uh, the high paid jobs like uh, uh, CSS, PMS and other uh, jobs that are offered by uh, Federal Public Service Commissions. So students who are deficient in English uh, they take help from these academies. And uh, for, for this research, I have taken uh, two um, kinds of academies. That is academies that are coaching for CSS and also the academies that are coaching for IELTS. Why I have chosen this? Because now, nowadays there is a kind of like a boom in these kind of practices like students uh, after graduation are moving towards competitive examinations and also students after the, their graduation uh, go abroad. So they, this market is now flourishing a lot. Uh, the current study is concerned with the linguistic market of Pakistan held by coaching academies and their strategies of promotion to attract English language learners. So uh, the, my, stat my statement of problem is that how these academies uh, market their services in such a way that they create want for English language. Now in Pakistan, there is a, a huge body of research available uh, on the uh, formal education systems like schools, colleges, universities, and their policies about the English language. But uh, there is a very scarce research. Uh, there is very little research that has been conducted on these private institutions. So I'm trying to connect that how they advertise and how students perceive it and how students uh, are uh, affected in order to go there and to invest on themselves and to get the proper legitimate language. So uh, in this uh, uh, research, my research questions are that how do coaching academies market the notion and position themselves as the providers of legitimate language that is English to potential learners and how do students perceive the advertised legitimate English language offered by coaching academies? On one side, I'm taking the perspective of the coaching academy, and on the other side, I'm taking the perspective of the students that how they view this practice. Um, I will skip the literature review due to limitation of uh, the time. Uh, my research methodology is that this is a, a power qualitative research. Uh, and uh, I'm taking the uh, interpretive paradigm because here I will interpret this social phenomena. Uh, and for data analysis, uh, uh, I am taking the uh, uh, constructivist grounded theory because constructivist grounded theory helps you to theorize a social phenomena where uh, you take the qualitative data in the form of the interviews and in the form of the um, documents and you code it then after coding, open coding, you take the uh, focus codes and then you group focus codes under the uh, common category on the basis of their analytic sense. And then those focus groups combine to form a theme. And my uh, research uh, methodology includes, uh, my, res uh, my research uh, theoretical framework includes neoliberalism and globalization. As I talked that uh, neoliberalism, it's a kind of ideology where individuals and organizations are free from governmental clutches. And neoliberalism, uh, as I talked earlier, has capitalized the abstract social practices like, like languages. So uh, the value of English due to neoliberal globalism 
uh, has industrialized the English language, which is dealt with uh, as a community and free market. Free market means that there is no one to control this market, perpetuating unequal access to English language, which has become a marker of middle class identity. Another my another my uh, another theory that is included in my uh, theoretical framework that is social linguistics of globalization by Blumert. So here I will take, uh, I have limited it to a few concepts that is mobile linguistic resources. According to him, the linguistic resources like uh, speaking, writing, all these are not static. These are mobile. And by mobile, he means that uh, there are uh, spaces. Within the spaces, these linguistic resources move. Here in Pakistan, if I speak, so uh, that, that is not as much accurate or that does not convey as much uh, meaning as compared to a native speaker. Uh, so this property, this, this kind of phenomena is called indexicality of a language. Uh, and indexicality of a language causes social inequality and uh, is termed as orders of indexicality. Now these orders of indexicality varies like a person, suppose I'm taking an example, uh, a, a student who is studying in a general private school and, and uh, Another student of the same level is studying in the Beacon House School. So both of them will have a linguistic resource, English, they will have it, but their orders of indexicality will be different. Like the meaning, uh, the, the student that is whether it belongs to a uh, general private school is conveying through his uh, language and the other that is conveying through him will be different. Uh, and another is polycentricity. Polycentricity, it is like related to the center of authority who is teaching the English language. So uh, I'm taking these concepts and with these concepts, I will uh, explain my findings. So uh, since this is a thesis and it has many things, so uh, and due to limitations of time, I will just discuss a single theme that what academy do and what is the role of higher education. So my first theme is uh, advertising for bridging educational gaps, the interplay of schooling, higher education, and the role of academy in English language development. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing is that the first category within this theme is uh, uh, that uh, uh, targeting and strategically enhancing the sense of lacking of the student, that how academies target the lack of the language resources in the students. Now, IELTS or English coaching, uh, this is this is like the first example where in the advertisement uh, uh, instructor says like IELTS or English language could be coming between you and your dreams of studying abroad. If we look here, so the extract indirectly links the dreams with the higher scale of indexicality, like the students who are who having a low scale of indexicality, they cannot go abroad because it will become a hindrance for them. On the other side, there is uh, on the other side, there is appropriate and acceptable language use, uh, uh, and on the other side, a deviant or abnormal language use. This is this is what Bloomer said that if we have the deviant uh, uh, type of language that is that is not acceptable in the global market, so we cannot go outside it. So here, the uh, orator says things like this. Participants, uh, when we interviewed the participants regarding this issue, uh, so they also expressed that yes, they have the English language deficiency. So, uh, and they expressed it like, uh, in school and in college, I did not practice it because teachers did not taught us the way it was needed. This student belonged to the general private school uh, like th th that he had studied in the school that was based in, the will in his village. So if we look, so academies target their English language deficit deficiency because they know it, that sure. there is deficiency in the market. You have one minute to conclude. Thank oh, you. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, then if we look, they're targeting the students' anxieties also, that, that they have the English language anxieties due to their low educational uh, uh, background. Similarly, why why this uh, educational uh, deficiencies, this English language deficiencies come? Because we have a stratified education system in Pakistan. Uh, next, uh, the higher education also does not address the students' needs, uh, English language needs, because of the uh, uh, limitations of the syllabus and uh, uh, grade-driven examination system. 
uh, and then now uh, uh, students, since students have different educational backgrounds, so they have different variant needs for their academies. Some go to the academies in order to uh, learn the English grammar and others go to the academies in order to know about the pattern. So in both things, if we look, they cannot handle the linguistic resource. That's why they are going to the coaching centers. So here we conclude that uh, English is sold in the market with highly strategic design of the advertisement, keeping in view the importance of the English according to the new liberal trends of Pakistani market. In Pakistan, English along with the national education policy is practiced in the private educational industry for the economic purposes, which is immune from educational policy. That's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for taking up the stance, a much needed stance. Dear listeners, the next speaker of the session is Dr. Merit Gule Gurbanab. He is from Dovlim Ahmed Azadi, Turkmen National Institute of World Languages, Turkmenistan. The topic of his is integrating culture-friendly materials in EFL classes in promoting global peace. Dr. Gurbanab, please proceed. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for accepting our paper for the presentation. And I would like to thank all the conference team, the National Conference on Applied Linguistics. And shall I share my screen? Previous one, I guess they should stop sharing the screen. Please stop sharing your screen. Mr. Ibrahim, please stop sharing your screen. Mr. Ibrahim, are you with us? Please stop sharing your screen. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for uh, giving me this pitch. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as you have introduced my presentation titled Integrating Culture-Friendly Materials in EFL Classes uh, in Promoting Global Peace, we have uh, titled in this way. Uh, let me just start uh, with my production. So in this paper, actually, uh, we try to focus on the importance of using cultural and moral values in uh, EFL textbooks in general, and its benefits for EFL learners, because uh, in our context, English is foreign language. And the main part of this paper is concerned with the role of cultural and moral values in EFL textbooks, its relationship with the English. And uh, we want to highlight that is it a burden or need I mean, uh, introducing or incorporating culture-friendly materials. And uh, I will come to the point of content and language-integrated learning in this paper, and uh, I will try to provide a definition for culture and uh, what the research methods we have used here. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. So let me just uh, start with defining the culture uh, in there are lots of definitions for culture, but I have taken a few here. So culture involves uh, creation of art, structure of education, scope of ethics and direction and application of scientific and religious analysis. I have taken this from Dua and uh, Manan Mani. And then I have again uh, used the definition from UNESCO that they have uh, published a document and there it is uh, given in this way, a distinctive set of spiritual, material, emotional, and intellectual features of society or a social group. And uh, it encompasses in addition to arts and literature, lifestyle, ways of living, traditions, and beliefs. So uh, uh, from Samawash, Porter, and Stefania, actually, they have a work titled Communication Between Cultures, and I have used another definition for that because it uh, takes kind of broader definition. So uh, they say 
culture, the deposit of knowledge, experience, beliefs, values, actions, attitudes, meanings, hierarchies, religion, notions of time, roles, special relations, concepts of the universe, and artifacts acquired by a group of people in the course of generations through individual and group strife. Uh, comparing to the previous one, uh, it takes some more uh, things. In, I mean, they have included uh, a few more things. So I just want to uh, share with you uh, what the Turkmen culture and how the Turkmen culture is. Uh, our country, Turkmenistan, is a country that has uh, one of the older civilizations, which has made a significant contribution to the development of world culture. Uh, and uh, so historical source provide that in the third and second millennium before Christ, big states were established on this territory. And uh, so we have several uh, sayings, proverbs, where, for example, hospitality or respect to seniors, honesty and sincere generosity are highlighted. And uh, here I just want to highlight one of them. Uh, it's a, a kind of, I mean, showing or highlighting, let's say, hospitality. So uh, in our culture, we have we say the uh, guest as a messenger of Allah, and hence there is a proverb even, the guest is higher than the father. I mean, the guest is more respected than the uh, father. In that sense, they have mentioned that. Or if your neighbor is happy, you will be happy too. The other proverb, again, it's uh, something related to culture, and uh, in our culture, we value neighborhood in that way. Yeah, let me start with the literature review. I just yeah, will point a few things over here. There is interlink between language and culture, and uh, there are different ways in this regard. So the relationship between language and culture is that they are like two sides of the same coin, one cannot be taught without the other. There is uh, one point here. And there's another thing that uh, some scholars in teaching a language, uh, they are good at. It's crucial to teach the culture of its people since one cannot learn to use a language without knowing the culture of the people who speak that language. And there are a few more points on that. And uh, Yes. Uh, here, question is like whose culture should be taught in ELT classes? And uh, from Jamal Pekin, I have uh, quoted one point over here. He says, as varied as the numerous English speakers around the world. And uh, this is uh, in the previous slide, I have shared that language and culture like two sides of a coin. Uh, and uh, I have mentioned that. One cannot be taught without the other, but uh, from Jamal Tekin and from some other scholars, as English is a global language, or as English and the users of English is varied, so as varied as the numerous English speakers around the world they have mentioned. And uh, English is, uh, as you know, is not uh, the language of, I mean, just the English speaking world. From research, I have taken this quotation, and uh, English is no longer viewed as the property of the English-speaking world, but is an international commodity. So the cultural values of Britain and the U.S. are often seen as irrelevant to a language teaching, except in situations where the learner has a pragmatic need for such information. So the language teacher need no longer be an expert on British and American culture and literature specialist as well. This I have taken from Jack Richards. And uh, this is uh, quite relevant to my study. And uh, here I want to just uh, highlight that. Even uh, some other scholars like Akai, uh, Widdowson, Jenkins, Gupta, I mean, they're also supporting the same way. I mean, they say that if we are teaching English, then it should not be just the British culture or American culture. I mean, we can include uh, various cultures 
the as the user of energy. So the use of local materials uh, in some cases, uh, it's I mean in, from our experience we have seen that will lead to more successful language learning as they will incorporate the cultural values of the students. So uh, even the student and the teacher they will not be alien to the culture, uh, which is uh, let's say highlighted in the EFL textbooks, and in that way so learning. Uh, and the context of the language learning is familiar to the teacher, familiar to the student. And uh, we have seen that in our experience, in our study, we have seen that this familiarity uh, made the students more motivated. And from Pakistan, also, I have uh, taken pronouncing uh, wrong way. Please uh, correct me. So a recent study which was conducted in Pakistan is a good example for this. And this study was conducted to look at the useful for intermediate students. And uh, results based on the questionnaire interviews and on the spot observation revealed that the text on Tinam by Shahid Nadim to teach language through drama was found to be more interesting and motivating than uh, English play. I mean, they have uh, had a kind of comparative study uh, and uh, they compared these two different uh, plays and uh, they found that uh, when they used local material, culturally friendly material, uh, they found that students are more motivating and interested in the, I mean, uh, the result were, was uh, much positive and productive. So we have used research methodology in this study. We tried to uh, get some data from interviews, uh, questionnaires, classroom observations. materials which the teachers have used in their classes. And uh, so as I have mentioned, so uh, and the questionnaire was completed by 20 EFL teachers, 30 secondary school graduates and 100 high school students at different education institutions here. So the questionnaire was administered to the students with the help of their teachers. Interview was conducted uh, with 10 ELT experts. So uh, the importance of this study is that uh, we came to this point that teaching culture in the year improves communication and makes teaching more authentic as uh, materials which we have selected and uh, which we have, uh, let's say, advice suggested to the classes were authentic materials, most of them like uh, traditional tales which were promoting cultural values and culture in EFL textbooks cannot be a burden it is need from the first day of the study and the culturally friendly materials help in promoting a greater awareness understanding and enriching the local and universal accepted cultural and moral knowledge and promotes global peace because uh, those cultural and moral values, uh, they, I mean, we try to focus on those uh, which uh, we have seen that when, for example, we use these kind of materials, uh, the, I mean, the friendly atmosphere inside the class is increasing and uh, student-teacher relationship is also uh, better and even uh, for example, when the students are participating in their discussions, again, uh, they are more friendly. So as it increases the motivation of the students to learn English effectively, this is uh, also another case, another important point, because uh, those materials which uh, were used in our observation, uh, they had some kind of uh, discussion points. I mean, which made or which helped teacher 
teachers and even students to have kind of discussion speaking activities. And later, uh, some of the teachers, they had uh, extra writing materials which have provided. So the purpose of this study is uh, aims at researching the role of culture, the use of culture in ELT materials, especially in textbooks. And the purpose of this study is mainly to integrate and promote cultural and moral values and highlighting the importance in ELT materials and textbooks. It's a kind of contribution to the global peace. And uh, because even I did not mention that here, but uh, in SDGs also, uh, those say that, when, for example, we have uh, culturally friendly materials, the quality of English language education is also increases. And uh, findings of this study have shown that the uh, Thank you very much, sir, for discussing the increasing importance of integrating culture into English language teaching and providing authentic language use models. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to introduce another speaker of the session, Dr. Gunal Humatova Saleh. She is from Azerbaijan State Pedagogical University, Azerbaijan. Her topic is Isa Hussainov's prose and literary criticism. I invite Dr. Saleh to speak on the subject, please. Hello, I am Finel uh, Matova. I am joining from Pedagogical University of Baku, city of Azerbaijan. First of all, I am greeting all of you. I am greeting our brother country of Pakistan. You are very valuable to us. I am very thankful to each of you for speaking us of the most difficult day of our country. Also, I would like to thank the Yes. Other devices. Yes. Yes. Uh, university and second France organization for organization such a founded conference and for invited me to this uh, conference. I am very pleased to meet you in here. Uh, in addition, I am very uh, mistake, sorry me, because I, I don't uh, oh, perfect now for English. Uh, with my and I am sorry. It's okay, ma'am. You can continue. It's a scene of prose and literature, a criticism. Gunil uh, was the head teacher and uh, the department of the language teacher uh, technology. Uh, the first uh, uh, sub chapters in invasion route uh, break of the period of Azerbaijan literature uh, when Isahi Senov against the activities of the uh, literature process, the new quality uh, stage uh, coalitions in the uh, learning also and uh, the Picture from the session, the fiction which is a sign of, of thinking and important to living and to piercing and his uh, poorest in uh, uh, possible factors, uh, methodology uh, of the non concentrated theory of uh, that time. Here it is a substation and and a uh, sign of the right. It's a great writer of Azerbaijan and to his history. Is, uh, well, I am sorry, it is a substitution as a set of the, the uh, dictionaries of culture uh, and, and uh, the Juventus Aegis uh, is 100 thousand uh, and uh, definition uh, sociological uh, application and a uh, cancer of a log to be acquainted. Uh, 
quantity before the partly to realis end. And here it is a uh, substantial that are after the uh, discussion of a cupid, a central committee to the, of the all union and composition party on the literature and, uh, and the art of winking the year so of uh, 1,100 to 40, 50, 1,100 to 40, uh, ages with the anti Leningrad magazines so for uh, 15 August, so for 1,947, uh, uh, the discussions so of a preparations and Prepositions or over dreams, theaters, and to minister to imperial age at 26 August, uh, Augustus, as uh, 1946 act, ideology, social application to literature, so was a summation to harden to also the activities of magazines based on anti Leningrad that, um, that applicated the relation of life in the country. After we writing about the novel of a girls in the context of that you said it is uh, necessary to generalize the, the criticism uh, attitude to Issa Hussainov's uh, ambiguous novel Ella of a girls into accession. Uh, first, that uh, features um, satisfying the, the criticism and um, uh, features uh, distinct the uh, criticism. Issa of criticism is divided into two uh, so, uh, periods. Uh, at first period states of great activity the period in which the works of a girl so the down star variations uh, to the second stage the period in which the work starts uh, the melody of uh, Tutak, Kola, Kyoha, a network and alien men, the dry uh, butho, the burning heart eked, where writing. Uh, the third stage is uh, that um, standing with the gel, the works of the first stage of this period are characterized by a uh, typology, acting and a difference in time so on here to from uh, the view of the substance uh, uh, measured and problems tracked in our girls uh, and the uh, downstart and um, by Sahid Senos of uh, by a uh, so so from ideology the uh, printing hurt and uh, the down stats. Um, uh, this a uh, serious auto novels uh, uh, demonstrate a series of uh, attitudes such as the fact that in science of the beginning of the world, the history of the uh, the history of the human relegation language, uh, philosophical uh, understanding and uh, perfect and uh, the also rebel is a um, belief to power as a writer. Context strict times from are uh, more to the other as a whole. Um, uh, thanks you for your attention. Thanks you very much. If you are uh, speaking uh, very uh, many mistakes, I am sorry, but I said that I uh, perfectly know in English. Thank you very much, ma'am, for highlighting the evolution of literary criticism towards Hussainov's writing and providing a comprehensive overview of the topic. Dear participants, Thank you. Mr. Lukman Nikola Kiarabi, he is from Osman State University, Ozogbo, Nigeria. The topic of his presentation is Bringing African Children's Literary Imagination into Visuality. Application of Artificial Intelligence in Recreating Aloha Pagbi, the Yoruba. Over to you.
Excuse me, sir. Please unmute yourself so we can hear you. I'm here, thank you. Lukmon Nabi Solake, how you is my name, from Nigeria. The title of my study is Bringing African Children's Literary Imagination into Visuality. Alo Akpagbe. Alo Akpagbe is the Yoruba children folk saves. My statement of problem, literary and cultural pictures created in the performance of Aloha Kwagbe, the Yoga children folk things are usually imaginary. Modern audience of this genre, predominantly children, find it difficult and, to fully uh, understand the period. Hello? Uh, Ms. Rukman, would you please like to share your screen with us? Okay. Thank you. Yes, I think I've shared it. As yeah. I was saying. Yeah, thank you. I'm thank sorry, you. I'm yeah. Statement of problem. Now, the children of nowadays find it difficult to understand the setting the, of the genre, the character, plot, and language of performance due to their little knowledge of the Yoruba traditional society. So the full aesthetic of Aloha Kwabi could be realized by this audience when applying artificial intelligence in making the performance, video performance of Aloha Kwabi. Now to the methodology. Digital transformational theory complemented by modernization theory was adopted as framework five documented of Aloha Pagbe from Ashanya Launitan and other textbooks were used. 20 children ages between 10 to 12 years who are audience of Aloha Pagbe were interviewed about their understanding of setting, periods, character, plot, and language use in the performance of this genre. So data analysis was qualitative data analysis was adopted. Now to Aloha Kabe, as I've mentioned, Aloha Kabe is also known as Aloha Newton. It is a narrated, it is narrated by headers among the Yoruba, the headers who are creative to entertain and to educate children. So what this translates is that right from its performance, Aloha people require creativity. Now, to artificial intelligence, uh, Muhammad in 2019 explained that artificial intelligence is a subdivision of computer science, which involves de developing computer programs that can compute tasks with human beings, with AI machine, learning automating analytical model building, neural method capacity, deep learning capacity, computer vision, and pattern recognition capacity and ability to present natural language is possible. So with this, using AI to create your cocktail for Antran production is very much possible. Let me now go to my data analysis. There exists a lot of elements in Aloha Kwagbe which tend to be elusive to children due to their little experience of their society, even in the olden days, not to talk of these modern days. Production of the AI inclined video performances of Yoruba Aloha Kabi for the consumption of children who are directly involved in Aloha Kabi performances, but find it difficult to have a full understanding of some of the elements of the genre. And those who have no opportunity to involve the performance, then the audience of Aloha Kabi do have problem with the setting of the, of the story. 
Now, how can we solve this problem? Is this? Many are not happy. Characters are way creations. No, I'm uncertain. I'm sorry. It's a character called Lokwebe. He was mentioned to be alone in a deep forest, which are husband that live in a giant until he took him. So that people, Hunt Hill is among the place of supernatural beings. It's a place where they reside. However, giant at hill common in deep forest. The imaginary description of deep forest and giant at hill may not be fully understood by children who have never been to such place. So using a high video application like Synthesia, Feed.hi, IIMV video, Victory, Deep Brain, Ella, and many others, we can create a, a, a section of deep forests. We are by the children who are audience of these folktales. We have deep knowledge, I mean, deep understanding and how this particular place look like. Also about the, the, the character. I also like to talk about the character. Many of the character of Alu Akpagbe are weird creations. Example of them are Aroni, a deformed being, or Sunny, a deity who is believed to name all the plant and herbs on heart by the Yoga people. We also have Olombo, a female weird creation with a long and big breast. We also have Yemoja, a half human, half fish creation. Or Iroko, a weird creation living in the Iroko tree. Shigidi, a wooden calf image, who is believed to have power of casting teeth. We have only a weird head. With the use of AI, generator, art guru, head shot, heart breeder, and typecast, Yoruba photo character could be generated so that the children will have the full understanding of how this creature look like. Then let me read the conclusion part. I mean the conclusion. I'm coming. So to conclude, we can see that if you make use of AI to generate, to create many of the performances that are believed to be oral, that are believed to be to be hold tradition which in whereby people or the audience will be able to understand what exactly the message this oral narration or oral genre are passing to the new generation or to the audience. The audience of this particular genre will be able to deduct or will be able to understand the full aesthetic and the full educative information in that particular uh, genre. And if we do this, then we, it, it will ensure that all our whole tradition are still relevant even in this um, uh, digital era. So this paper is a suggestion and uh, a, 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 it is suggesting into the literary field and also into the perform performance field that when we are using all these new facilities, internet, computer facilities, the, the, the literary imagination which people have about the, what actually those genres stand for will be fully understood by these audience. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your illuminative study on the application of artificial intelligence and the recreation of children's folk tales. The audience, our next presenters are Ms. Andalip Seher and Dr. Huma Batul from Air University, Islamabad, Pakistan. The subject of their presentation is Receptive and Expressive Language Abilities in a Child with Down Syndrome, a Psycholinguistic Case Study. Ma'am, you may proceed with your presentation. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
Um, can I please share my screen? Can you please stop sharing your screen? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Zandarib Sahar. I'm an MPhil scholar from Air University, Islamabad. The title of my study is Receptive and Expressive Language Abilities in a Child with Down Syndrome, a Psycholinguistic Case Study. This work is supervised by Dr. Homa Batul, an assistant professor at Air University, Islamabad. Uh, wait. Um, I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, so the Down syndrome, also known as trisomy 21, occurs uh, due to a complete or partial copy of chromosome 21. It was first described by John Langdon Down, uh, and he named it as Mongolism because, uh, according to him, these, uh, the facial features of these individuals uh, looked a lot like people from Mongolia. Later in 1959, Dr. Lijon discovered um, that uh, it is caused by the presence of an extra co uh, copy of chromosome 21. This was the first time that someone linked uh, a chromosomal disorder with intellectual disability. So uh, having said the foundation of Down syndrome, it is also important to uh, understand it from the perspective of psycholinguistics. Language processing in psycholinguistics uh, involves examining how the mind comprehends, produces, and acquires language. This field combines aspects of linguistics and psychology to understand the mechanisms behind language use and acquisition. Basically, uh, language has two types, receptive and expressive. Receptive language is basically understanding the language, comprehending it, and uh, expressive is uh, used for communicating, where we also produce um, speech. So people with Down syndrome um, understand uh, language better uh, than they can express it. That is, their uh, receptive abilities are better than their expressive abilities. So children with Down syndrome um, rely more on gestures, facial expressions, and body language for communication. Uh, now, these gestures um, uh, play a very important role in aiding their comprehension and expression um, uh, among these um, individuals. Here you can see a comprehensive study that was conducted by Bonn in 1998 and later revised by Leighton in 2004. Um, uh, they basically compared the milestones of uh, typically developing children uh, with uh, children with Down syndrome according to their age range. Uh, as you can see that uh, there is a significant delay in uh, seen in children with uh, Down syndrome and uh, their milestones. This is some of the literature that I reviewed uh, for my study. Uh, and uh, to contextualize my study more, um, I also reviewed some of the literature that was conducted on Down syndrome in Pakistan. These studies were mostly exploratory in nature uh, and they um, um, studied more uh, the, uh, about the experiences of parents uh, that were raising these children with Down syndrome and uh, uh, some were uh, about the challenges that uh, these individuals uh, faced on daily basis and also um, the challenges that their families um, faced. 
So uh, despite the uh, prevalence of Down syndrome, there is a notable gap, uh, gap in research, especially in understanding word level language processing in children with Down syndrome. And here comes my study. Uh, so my study aims to uh, bridge this gap to analyze a case study focusing on enhancing language skills through tailored speech therapy interventions. My study aims to answer uh, the following research questions. Uh, the first one is how does the speech production in a child with Down syndrome align with the stages outlined in leveled speech production model? The second one is what impact does specialized speech therapy have on improving both the response time and accuracy of speech production in a child with Down syndrome? Uh, so the, um, the research method that was used in this study is a mixed method. That is, it uh, involves both quantitative and qualitative. Um, the population is a single participant. So this is a single participant case study. And my participant was a 13 years old child with Down syndrome. My study followed research ethics. That is a consent form was filled out by the uh, caretaker of the participant. And uh, they were also provided with the participant information sh uh, sheet um, that, uh, uh, that included uh, proper guidance on what the experiment will en entail. Okay, uh, for the data collection uh, for the phase one, which was the speech assessment, uh, her, uh, the speech assessment of the child with Down syndrome was examined uh, uh, by the uh, SLP, that is a speech language pathologist. Uh, uh, she also uh, utilized uh, speech records that were um, uh, uh, taken from the participants, uh, uh, from the participants' parents. Uh, the SLP created a list of words and categories uh, and her current, uh, the participants' current speech was assessed. So um, the familiar words uh, were ticked off from the list and the unfamiliar words were uh, left. Um, furthermore, the response time and accuracy were recorded. These are uh, the categories uh, that, uh, that was created by the SLP. So it contained fruits, vegetables, food, shapes, animals, birds, tra transport, body parts, counting, and concepts. So the to total number of words were 50. For phase two, which was the SLP intervention, uh, this was conducted for three weeks and each session lasted for 45 minutes. The unfamiliar words that, the, um, uh, that were, take, uh, that were uh, left uh, from the category, they were uh, taught to the participant in this intervention. And after three weeks, the response time and accuracy were checked again. The theoretical framework that I used for my study was the Levels model. Um, and uh, uh, the focus was from the lemma uh, level to the uh, phonological or the articulation level. So uh, uh, for the data analysis, um, Children with Down syndrome have been shown to learn through imitation. Research has demonstrated that young children with Down syndrome can exhibit deferred imitation, allowing them to learn no, uh, novel behaviors from observation and retain them. Results were drawn during and after the therapy of child's ability to recognize and produce words. So to answer my first question, uh, how does the speech production in a child with Down syndrome align with the stages outlined in leveled speech production model? So accurate response times are recorded for each tested word, providing a detailed data set. Effective progression from lemma to the morphological encoding stage was seen in the production. Uh, there were some challenges identified at the phonological stage, especially when she was asked to name visuals. And uh, initial concept expression was difficult, even with hand gestures, highlighting the need for specialized uh, support in speech production for Down syndrome. Uh, to answer my second question, uh, what impact does specialized speech ther therapy have on improving both the response time and accuracy of speech production in a child with Down syndrome? This is for the first part, that is the um, response, uh, response time. Uh, sorry, for the accuracy. Um, the accuracy before and after the therapy was seen. So for the receptive accuracy before therapy, it was uh, seen at about 55%. And after therapy, it was um, around 70%. For the um, e expressive accuracy, uh, it was um, before therapy, it was uh, around 32 32% and after therapy, it was around 
And for the response time, the expressive response time after the three weeks uh, speech therapy intervention, the average response time for expressing, uh, expressing concept was recorded at approximately 2.752 seconds. This time frame indicates the child's processing speed, informing and articulating words. And the receptive response time in comparison, the average response time for the receptive understanding of concepts was faster at approximately 1.1925 seconds, indicating a quicker comprehension of words and their production. However, it is important to note that the duration of the intervention, only three weeks, may not have been sufficient to observe a significant change in expressive and receptive response times. So the current study supports and extend, extends previous research on Down syndrome children having stronger receptive abilities and a lack of expressive uh, language. It can be useful in studying the receptive and expressive abilities of children with Down syndrome with no history of special education or speech therapy. Their initial stages of morphological knowledge could be examined based on the theoretical uh, framework used in this study. So to conclude, children with Down syndrome exhibits common language and communication traits which, uh, with uh, notable individual variations. Generally, vocabulary tends to surpass syntactic skills and receptive language is stronger than expressive language in this population. Utterances produced by children with Down syndrome are often shorter and less complex than expected, uh, aligning with their nonverbal mental age. The current study focused on the morpho morphology level of language in a year, uh, uh, in a 13 years old uh, child with Down syndrome, specifically examining expressive abilities within the speech production model. The expressive language of the participant encompasses only about 10% of common concepts, suggesting a limited range of verbal expression. Based on these findings, further speech therapy is recommended to enhance expressive language skills and a potential avenue for future research involves conducting a longitudinal study to track the participants' progress in linguistic abilities over time. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, for providing us the detailed insights into the language challenges faced by children with Down syndrome, particularly in articulating speech sounds. Ladies and gentlemen, with this, our presentations are concluded. Now we are going to begin with a question answer session. Throughout the session, we received several inquiries. The first question is directed to the chair of the session, Dr. Iram Amjad. And the question is, kindly explain how the model that you have used to discourse historical approach specifically helps in analyzing solicitors' fallacious arguments. All right. Uh, uh, discourse historical approach is basically uh, used to analyze the fallacious reasoning. And um, uh, Radak has proposed the various uh, uh, fallacies, like in terms of uh, hominem attacks, appeal to emotion. And they all have an impact on the fairness of the trial by distorting evidence and swaying the judge or the jury's perception. I hope I've answered the question. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your reflection. The next question is directed to Dr. Huma Batul. The question is, the presentation mentioned the importance of timely speech and language therapies. Could you provide more details on the types of therapies that have been proven effective in promoting neurocognitive recovery in children with aphasia? I guess, um, can you come up with a question again, please? Sorry. Um, your presentation mentioned the importance of timely speech and language therapies. Mm -hmm. Could you provide more details on the types of therapies that have been proven effective in promoting neurocognitive recovery in children with aphasia? All right. Now, with reference to speech and language therapies, I think uh, the speech and language therapists, they have already devised curriculum for this. So it actually depends upon the, the needs of the, of the case, for example, that, that is under study or the cases that are under study. For example, for the cases that were under study in, uh, in, in our research, the aphasic children, uh, we actually uh, conducted study, uh, the, the therapies with reference to attention, focus, and memory. And then with reference to attention, focus, and memory, the kind of activities that, that were designed by SLPs they were used. Of course, we do not have, uh, I must say, um, the, the, the right kind of certification for devising certain kinds of language, speech and language therapies. 
uh, SLPs, they are expert on, on all these things. But still, if you remember, I also mentioned near the end that even in Pakistan, when you talk to SLPs about a culturally and linguistically diverse population of Pakistan, they have their limitations. They say that they do not have language assessment batteries that can cater to these needs. So whatever are the, uh, the internationally available language assessment batteries, they are actually making use of them. And sometimes they cannot make use of them. Why? Because uh, the, the way uh, those assessment batteries, they need to be administered. They cannot be administered. The very first limitation is the language itself because they are in English. Uh, here, those uh, two children with aphasia, their parents, they were uh, from a very humble background and um, they could hardly speak Urdu. Of course, their mother uh, tongue was uh, Punjabi and then certain other regional languages that they belong to. So uh, these are the kinds of limitations uh, which uh, even speech language pathologists they encounter. So I think for now, I cannot give any verdict that which specific speech language uh, pathology, pathology or assessment battery can help because for now, unfortunately, even in Pakistan, uh, in certain cases, especially with reference to childhood aphasia, even the SLPs, um, they don't have the right answer. This is what was told uh, by the those two SLPs that actually worked with us. But uh, with reference to what can be effective and what cannot be effective, I think further studies need to be uh, conducted and administered to actually see that which kind of specific language therapy um, uh, not just activities, curriculum that that uh, that speech language pathologists uh, claim to have uh, with them uh, worked with which children with aphasia and not only aphasic children, children with certain other speech and language and communication disorders. So for now, uh, I also don't feel, um, you know, um, the, the authority to talk about all these things. It is uh, the speech language pathologists. Um, they, they are still clueless about certain things, but I think together we need to work on all these gaps that at least we can see, we can find out just in, the, uh, in, 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 in a formal or informal interview with the SLPs and through the, uh, the specific work that was done. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your comprehensive response. Now I invite Dr. Iram Amjad, chair of the session, for her concluding remarks. All right. Uh, although it's the last session, uh, it remained a very successful event. My heartiest congratulations to Dr. Shaban and all the organizers. All the presenters gave very insightful talks. Uh, they were meaningful in terms of diverse aspects of applied linguistics. Uh, uh, first of all, Dr. Huma Batul, she gave a very uh, good talk on neuroimaging role in understanding language recovery in childhood aphasia, emphasizing the importance of timely interventions of neurocognitive recovery. Then we have uh, Dr. Ibrahimovo, who explored the phonosemantics of lexical categories in Azerbaijani. Uh, Azerbaijan. Um, and then we have Mohammed Ibrahim and Dr. Sham Heather who investigated the commodification of English in Pakistan, examining how coaching academics market linguistic resources use new liberal ideology. Then we have Dr. Gabovno, uh, Gabovno uh, who discussed the integration of uh, cultural uh, friendly materials in EFL classes in Turkmenistan, highlighting the role of culturally enriched content in motivating English language learners. Uh, we have another very in, uh, interesting talk by Dr. Gunel, who analyzed Isa Hasanov's prove and its reception by literary criticism, employing historical comparative and structural methods to explore the writer's creativity. Then we have uh, 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 Mr. Lukman's uh, uh, application of artificial intelligence in recreating Yoruba's children folk, tool, uh, folk tales, uh, revealing the potential of AI to enhance understanding and appreciation of cultural narratives. Uh, then next we have uh, Andalip Sahar and Dr. Huma, who presented a psycholinguistic case study on a child with Down syndrome, focusing on receptive and expressive language abilities to inform the tailored speech therapy interventions. I hope uh, all these 
talks are involved. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving much. us interesting talks. With this, we come to the end of our session. Our next session is the concluding session that will be moderated by Mr. Hamid Hussain Shah. So I request Mr. Hamid to please proceed. Thank you. Uh, dear audience, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, we have come to the final legs of the conference. I believe you have had a wonderful learning experience throughout the conference. In the final session, we have with us Dr. Muhammad Islam, Dr. Nushaba Yunus, and Dr. Samina Nadim. Dr. Islam is PhD in ELT and Applied Linguistics from the University of Leeds, UK, and MA in Applied Linguistics from UN of Leicester. He is serving as HOD at Department of English Linguistics, uh, Lahore. He is also a member of Syndicate at the University of Punjab. We welcome Dr. Islam for the final remarks about the conference. Dr. Islam, are you with us? Uh, now I would call uh, uh, Dr. Nushaba. She is Associate Professor and Head Department of English at Rifai International University, Faisla. Uh, she has a number of publications. So Dr. Nushaba, if you are around in the meeting room. Now I'll call uh, the focal person of the conference, Dr. Samina Nadim, to have remarks and a note of thanks. Over to Dr. Samina Nadim. Alhamdulillah. We are here to conclude our two-day conference, ICAL 2024. Managing a conference is a phenomenon. Until the last minute, there are sureties which turn otherwise and new ones erupt to challenge us anew and afresh. The Department of English Linguistics and Literature, Islamabad feels blessed for the continuation of its traditions of holding a conference annually. This platform provides a chance to our students to experience research perspectives, interdisciplinary foci, and insights into contemporary and future research trends presented by our international and national scholars and researchers. It therefore becomes a huge teacher support for our MPhil and BS level students. They get an opportunity to assess the variety of excellence churned through years of experience through the presentations and the skills of communication. Hence, their confidence grows and such experiences lend them the desired maturity for which we all aspire. I am actually grateful to all the presenters for creating an environment of learning, and we hope that some collaborations may extend the spectrum further. My heartfelt gratitude 
to the international presenters from Azerbaijan, Algeria, China, India, Indonesia, Iraq, Jordan, Malaysia, Morocco, Nigeria, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and Singapore. And my special thanks to the national level presenters who represented all the four provinces in the real sense. Altogether, we had 45 presentations. Hence, without any hesitation, as focal person of the conference, on behalf of the Department of English, I extend my gratitude and appreciation to each and every keynote speaker and presenter of the conference. I am also thankful for the rich attendance by our guests, speakers, and students. Day one attendance was more than 250, and today being Sunday, the number was a little less. At Rifa University, our department feels responsible for the blended obligation of teaching English as a language with all its nuances offered through linguistics and literature and understanding the diversity of culture and values through a confidence for the significance of identity and character building. I am hugely indebted to the patronage of our worthy chancellor, Mr. Hassan Mohammed Khan, our honorable vice chancellor, Professor Dr. Anis Ahmed, and Dean Social Sciences, Professor Dr. Atiku Zafar Khan, for their full-time support and guidance in this regard. ICAL 2024, with its continuity, has put us on a schedule for all the years to come. Without any hesitation, I give all the credit for this to our head of the department, Professor Dr. Mohammed Shaban Rafi, for his roadmap, guidance, and directions, which make our task convenient and convincing. I am also thankful to the Board of Advisors, organizers, moderators, volunteers, and all the faculty members for their commitment and enthusiasm. It is with their support that we achieve success in our endeavors. The conference format was initially physical, but due to unavoidable circumstances, it was brought to the virtual level while bringing in new demands. I am grateful to all our presenters for being supportive of this change, which was beyond our hands. Furthermore, we were lucky to get the due support from the respective departments, and it is only with their help that the big shift was handled amicably. I extend my gratitude to the following departments of G7 campus, Rifa International University. I am thankful to the operations department for providing full assistance as need be with my special mention of Mr. Heather Abbas. I extend my gratitude to the IT department and salute to the support of Mr. Sultan Mahmood and Hamza. Success of the conference was put in their hands and they helped us sail through. My thanks to the procurement department for all the arrangements required for the conference, with my special thanks extended to Mr. Azram Abbas and Amar Bilal. I extend my huge thanks to the marketing department for their full, full support. And in person, I would like to thank Vakas Harun and Vakar Khan. Thank you very much, students, for your presence and active and interactive participation. I'm sure you have marked your areas of research and are partly prepared for your semester assignments and projects. I feel happy, and it gives me profound pleasure that this year, the questions asked by you have been enhanced substantially. Last but not, not, not the least, I want to extend my special thanks to my colleagues, Hamid Hussain Shah and Nafisa Sarwar for making the conference happen in the real spirit. My young student intern, Fasiha Noor, has been a surprise to all of us as she displayed her computer and graph skills with every demand of the organizers. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Department of English Linguistics and Literature, Islamabad, will always be expecting the similar sort of a support from you all. Hence, I'm not going to say adieu and goodbye, and will conclude by saying we will be meeting again next year. Jazakallah khair Thank you so much. With us, Dr. Muhammad Islam and Dr. Nushaba Yunus. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Islam is PhD in Applied Linguistics from University of Leeds. He is serving as HOD at Department of English Linguistics and Literature. He is also a member of member of Syndicate at University of Punjab. We welcome Dr. Islam for the final remarks and reviews about the conference. Dr. Mo Muhammad Islam, over to you. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Can you hear me? 
Yes, loud and clear. All right, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, it is not ceremonial, but I generally feel uh, congratulating uh, Dr. Shaban Rafi and his team. His wonderful team, they have produced two conferences in two years. Uh, that's, that's a great achievement. And considering the circumstances, they have done it online this year. That's, that's really remarkable in, short, in such a short span of time. So congratulations, Dr. Shaban and your entire team. Uh, I would also like to congratulate uh, Dr. Atik Zafar, our Dean and uh, uh, the worthy Vice Chancellor for the page and support throughout uh, must be there and uh, congratulate the entire vision of uh, RIFA, uh, the managing team of RIFA. So since they are encouraging all these activities and these are happening for all of us. This conference, though I was busy uh, in uh, in the convocation here in Lahore campus, so, but I went through abstract book and all that, has uh, produced some wonderful ideas, I believe. Uh, conferences are met for scholarly interaction and for providing people platform to give their input and seek new ideas uh, for research, and, and as I said earlier, for scholarly uh, sharing. And this uh, conference has definitely served this purpose. And this was about uh, discovered the topics like ethics of research in applied linguistics. Then it also talked about future challenges and opportunities simultaneously, which is uh, generally appreciable. Working on artificial intelligence, which definitely is an opportunity for future uh, professionals in the field of ELT and linguistics. Uh, that, that, that there's something I generally believe should be uh, thought seriously because artificial intelligence is posing a lot of challenge to our research and classroom world. And uh, unfortunately, most of us in Pakistan, I would believe, are probably not bracing ourselves to, to the way it should be braced. And this, this conference would have given us certain ideas, thoughts to accept or to challenge it in a way, to accept it in a way which can be more fruitful and uh, can, can be productive in the com coming years for us. This reality is bigger than the reality we have already dealt. Uh, Artificial intelligence would challenge entire academia in coming days. But I believe as a humble participant of uh, English language teaching world, that this probably would affect us, uh, us the most as compared to other uh, streams of academia, I would say. So therefore, uh, this, this is probably a timely alarm for all of us to look into the opportunities it may, might offer to us. Otherwise, artificial intelligence tutors are smarter, quicker, uh, and in many ways better than us in the classroom. So they, they would definitely ask many questions in future. So thank you very much once again, Dr. Shaban, for raising these concerns for all of us and providing us these opportunities to think about uh, these, these issues for ourselves first and for our students also. I believe one way forward is to prepare ourselves first. Instead of trying and stop this uh, artificial intelligence in, uh, intervention or integration, we must brace it as, as educators or teachers or researchers first and should provide our students, uh, should pr prepare ourselves as role models for our students. We should let us let them know that how they can benefit uh, the most from artificial intelligence in their future learning and teaching. Uh, once again, congratulations to the, the team I call and thank you very much for uh, making me a part of it. Thank you, Dr. Islam. Thank you for your wonderful words. Uh, now I would call uh, Dr. Noshaba Yunus. Uh, she is Associate Professor and Head Department of English at Rifa International University, Faisalabad campus. Uh, 
Dr. Nishaba, over to you. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh, I would like to first uh, congratulate all the team who organized such a wonderful event. And last year, uh, I was present there in the conference, and I uh, saw a lot of things there that uh, inspired me and uh, made me realize that we can arrange a superb kind of such uh, events uh, without a lot of those formalities that were part uh, of conferences in the past, making it a three days conference or making it uh, boring for the students because students nowadays, they do not want to attend lengthy sessions. They do not want to sit for hours. Uh, so it was great there in Islamabad last year, and it is great uh, online today as well. So I congratulate Dr. Shaban and his team to provide students such platforms in this era where they're not even um, accustomed to join such kind of academic and uh, you can say fruitful events. So uh, I, I personally need and I personally want to work for these things and uh, in uh, not in only applied linguistics but psycholinguistics and neurolinguistics because uh, the emerging fields that need to be discussed that need to be uh, given to the people to get awareness so uh, I would again uh, request Dr. Shaban to work on these areas as well psycholinguistics and neurolinguistics please uh, for some uh, online symposiums or conferences that would be easier uh, for my uh, scholars uh, because we have uh, started PhD in English linguistics here and we want to introduce such kind of courses to them as well. So uh, keeping all these needs in mind, we need some uh, new parameters as well that the online the online media the, the or the online sittings that are necessary and uh, you invited me i'm very thankful and uh, i would wish a, a very best of luck to you all for the next times and uh, please consider the suggestions or the requests because uh, i want to uh, involve all the uh, departments uh, of English in different campuses in this. And uh, uh, we are planning to work on that, some online symposium or conference on psycholinguistics and neurolinguistics. Thanks a lot. Thanks again for such a wonderful event. Congratulations to all of you and uh, lots of best wishes and blessings to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Nushaba. Points noted and we will be working on them. Dear audience, that is all from us. Wait for our conference that will be held in, in the second week of April 2025. Uh, to this, signing off from G7 campus, Rifa International University. Thank you all. Thank you and blessings. Thank you.